Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Butterfield, this evening we'll bring greetings on behalf of our Rutgers University Newark Chancellor, Dr. Cancer, Dr. Butterfield. Good evening. I will keep this brief because I know we have a very important agenda and I'll be back up in front of your face in a, in a, a little bit. But on behalf of Chancellor Cancer and the, cha and the Chancellor's Office here at Rutgers University Newark, we are honored and delighted to host you all this evening as we talk about Clarity 2020 and think about how we move forward together, because as we know, nothing gets done without a collaborative process. So I thank you all for joining us this evening, particularly to our wonderful superintendent, Roger Leon, and we look forward to hearing the presentations. I, I have the benefit of knowing what's coming, but really look to forward to a dialogue with all of you as we move forward. Thank you again all for coming, and please enjoy your evening. Thank you, Dr. Butterfield. Good evening, Superintendent Leon, Board Chair Josephine C. Garcia, Board Members, Community, Parents, Students, Staff, and Families. Tonight is going to be awesome. I have to say that again. Tonight's going to be awesome. We got to give some energy, right? Tonight's going to be awesome. This evening, each round table, as well as some special guests, will have the opportunity to report the findings to you, Sir Superintendent Leon. But I have to ask you a quick question. Are you ready for us to fill you with loads and loads of data? I know you'll be pleased with the information gathered by the varying roundtables that took place since the beginning of 2019 to present, as well as all the audits that took place throughout the Newark Board of Education. Can I tell you that as the internal convener of the Partners Roundtable, I was able to hear how the partners perspective, how they see the district in the first year, in the third year, in the fifth year, and finally in the 10th year. The clarity that comes to light was eye-opening, truly aligned to the keys to 2020 and ultimately the game changers. Tonight though is about clarity 2020. The strategic plan that will begin on July 1st, 2019 and move us through June 30th, 2019. I think we need a round of applause for Clarity 2020 coming to life. <laughs> Superintendent Leon, each roundtable had the experience of engaging Clarity 2020 in its entirety, from conception to cradle to age three, where research, reflection, and response begin to the college to career track, whereby each party understood the importance of reinvesting, reinvigorating, and returning. We pledge to have our students return to the great city of Newark, whereby they will return to the workforce and give back. So I want you to take a moment, Superintendent Leon, and think back to the Teacher Academy announcement that took place at Eastside High School, where you shared with the students the importance of teaching in the city of Newark. You remember that, right, Superintendent Leon? This is the best example of reinvesting reinvigorating and returning to the great city of Newark. Tonight is all about the unveiling, the unwavering work of each round table as well as the audits that will assist with the finalization of Clarity 2020, because we're gonna be very clear at the end of tonight. And ultimately, the 10-year strategic plan entitled The Next Decade. Are you ready, everybody? Yeah. Superintendent Leon, are you ready? Are you sure? I'm taking some of his limelight tonight, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> Just a quick look at the timelines. In 2009, Great Expectations was launched by the Janey administration. Some of us remember the Great Expectations. If you look at the timeline, we had that strategic plan from 2009 through 2012. 
And then there's a blank in the formulation. There was no strategic plan. 2016 launched the next three years. That was the SURF administration, and it currently is living in our homes until June 30th, 2019. We cannot forget, we have a highly skilled professional here this evening, Ms. Mrs. Nelms, who has shown us the way through the transition plan, which began February 1st, 2018, and it will conclude in January of 2020. Now this is where the best times will begin. Clarity 2020. That will begin on July 1st, 2019, and will conclude on June 30th, 2019. Last but not least, the 10-year strategic plan, which I spoke about a few minutes ago, will be coined the next decade, and that one is gonna be the most exciting strategic plan yet. Without any further ado at this time, I would like to introduce my partner in this work, Dr. Lauren Wells, who has been instrumental, but most importantly, will provide more insight into the, the strategic planning process. Dr. Lauren Wells. Hello, Newark. How are you all doing this evening? Wonderful. This is truly an exciting evening. Uh, and I have the distinct pleasure of bringing you into three months of very intense, focused, and dedicated work that was conducted by, I'd say, about 20 members of the community, some of them internal to the school district and some of them external, as well as hundreds of people in the community who participated in roundtables, community meetings, a student conference. Before we get into that, there are some logistical things to work through. You all have a copy of the agenda, yes? So we are going to start with a report out from each of the roundtables. There were nine of them. That will be followed by a report out from the student conference. You will also hear a report out from the facilities review, as well as a report out from the district audits and updates uh, from the district on many things that are taking place in terms of curriculum and instruction. At the end, there will be time for public comment, uh, and we have set up a mic over here to the left to invite all of you to the mic to give comment on the things that you have heard, and also to talk about a little bit about anything that you think is missing. Um, and so I would like to say uh, thank you to the superintendent, uh, thank you to the district leadership, thank you to the conveners that participated in this work, thank you to everyone that attended a round table, a community meeting, to the students that participated in the round table and the student conference. It is truly a privilege to be able to be a part of the work in this way. Uh, I cannot emphasize that enough. I cannot repeat that enough as a resident of Newark, uh, as a member of this community. It is not just professionally impactful to do this, but it is personally important to me to be connected to the work that is happening in the schools and in the cities to improve the lives of our children and our families so that everyone here has the human dignity and the outcomes that they are worthy of and deserve in this life. Um, I would just like to take a few minutes to say thank you to my team who assisted with all of this work. I have Clifton Thompson who is here, uh, who is a consultant on my team, Sharon Wells who is the Vice President of Creed Strategies, as well as Dr. Yvette Jackson who has been doing intensive work internally with the school district as well as with the students. So let's talk a little bit about the process. When we met with you on January 16th at Central High School, we introduced Clarity 2020 to you. On the left side, you see the keys to Clarity 2020. We can understand those very simply as the resources, the stakeholders, and the institutions in the ecosystem that need to be organized in order to support our children from conception through college and career to achieve whatever their dreams, whatever their vision is in life. 
On the right side, you will see the game changers. These very simply can be understood as the interventions and strategies that we are going to use to accelerate our students' access to opportunities and achievement. In the center, we have the zero to three, zero to three to college and career continuum, and that really is just the lives of our children, right? We want to know that before they're born and from to the time they enter out into the workforce, that they have received every opportunity, every resource, every valuable thing that we can give them to help them be successful in life. And so in order to do this strategically, thoughtfully and intentionally, we have engaged since January in a community engagement process with many people in this room and with others in the community. That started on January 16th. It involved 27 roundtables. That is 27 meetings that took place between January and April that brought people together in different areas to discuss how to accomplish the goals that are set in Clarity 2020. Just go back and explain the six R's for everybody, please. Uh, okay. So, at the top of the logic model, we have the ideas of reinvest, reinvigorate, and return, which we heard Dr. Fitzhugh refer to several times. This is the idea that we are reinvesting in our students, we are re reinvigorating their connection to learning, and we are gaining a return from them. But at the same time, that applies to, those, to our students as well. They will reinvest in the city. They will return to the city to reinvigorate the city so that there is a continuous cycle of investing and returning that involves our young people, our community, and our resources. At the bottom of the logic model, you will see research, reflect, and respond. This is the idea that we are an ecosystem that learns, that understands what is happening in our system, that thinks together about what is happening in our system, and that works together to respond to what is happening in our system. And that includes the pluses and the minuses. We learn from what we're doing well, and we replicate those things, we spread them out, and we understand where we need to do more work. In March, we had a student conference, 250 6th through 12th graders convened at NJIT to engage in the strategic planning process. This is a pretty big deal, don't you think? 250 students came together to learn about educational practices and then to think and plan for how to apply those practices in their schools and in our district. And you will hear from a student tonight. There were six community meetings that took place, one in each ward and two specifically in the South Ward because there are two comprehensive high schools in the South Ward. And we are here tonight to give you a report out of all of that work that happened. Now at these meetings, there was a consistent process that was applied. So we've been in the district for a while, yes. And there's historically been a pattern of people saying, we don't know what's going on. We don't have any information. So as part of the Clarity 2020 strategic planning process, Superintendent Leon injected data. Around the room, you will see five data sets. These are the data sets that were examined at the roundtables, at the community meetings, and by students in order to really begin to get a sense from each individual stakeholder's perspective, what are the root causes that underlie the data and the data points that we see for us to begin to identify what our problems are and what we can do to solve them as opposed to being told what our problems are. So once we did the root cause analysis, that was followed by benchmarking. If this is where we are now, where do we wanna be in five years, in 10 years, in three years? What do we need to do in 2000, 2019 and 2020 in order to set the stage for major transformation in our district that will move our entire ecosystem to beginning to act in such a way that our students are guaranteed the opportunity to learn wherever they are. 
followed by benchmarking, the roundtables, and the community meetings got into developing strategies. Strategies for zero to three, strategies for grade three, for age three to grade three, strategies for grade six to grade nine, strategies for high school, strategies for college and career. And then the final step was that all of the strategies were compiled in one single document and every round table reviewed all of the strategies that were developed across all of the groups. So ultimately, everyone saw everything that came out of every meeting. And that's important because what it means is not only did our participants and our attendees and our conveners have the opportunity to develop their own ideas, they also had the opportunity to give input and guidance and direction into ideas that were developed in other meetings and other sessions. And so tonight, what you will hear is the culmination of very committed, very hard, very focused work. And I have to emphasize that because there was one meeting a month for three months and everyone has things that they're already committed to. There were teachers, there were district employees, people who run organizations, people who work for the city, but they dedicated their time to making sure that the process worked smoothly, that the meetings were held, and that they were informed in such a way to be able to lead them and to get to the results that you will see today. So without further ado, uh, I would like to call our first set of roundtable conveners, uh, Ms. Noreen Noel-Joyce and Ms. Antoinette Baskerville-Richardson. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out and supporting uh, Clarity 2020. We came up with three highlights from our community roundtable. Good evening. So I'll go over the highlights. Uh, highlight one, we build trust with parents, guardians, in response to their history and their, experi and their experiences with school. Highlight two, update policies and procedures to support students and families. And highlight three, connect parents to essential community-based programs, hospitals, et cetera, to provide authentic access to care. I see that you have some notes that you might want to detail uh, some of what has been said. Again, in support of Clarity 2020 to move forward, we came up with some um, touch points for highlight two. Uh, students who care for our parents, our guardians, or students who are working to help support the household, it's important that the parent, Superintendent Leon, that they wanted their students or their children to be a part of a work study program to sweet and shift their schedule where they would have a later start date or their internships can be provided by the, the community-based organizations to help support those students in internship programs and work-study programs. For highlight three, more parents wanted support for trauma-informed care to encourage healing within for social emotional support and growth to heal themselves because we have to be aware that we have a, a wonderful melting pot of uh, cultures in our city, in our school district. And it's important that if a family comes from a different country, their um, point of view and education from their country looks different from ours. So we have to be mindful of that process. Thank you. I'd just like to talk a little bit more about highlight one, about um, rebuilding trust with parents and guardians in response to their history and experiences with school. Um, and this varies from school to school, but many times people's perception about schools is based on their experiences with school, be it negative or positive. And while we always work for every school to be a welcoming and uh, cheerful place, that again varies from school to school. So that's something that we continually work on and that parents still always talk about. 
And the last point, um, some of our parents are having issues with um, immigration and different concerns surrounding that. And under Superintendent Leon's leadership, he encouraged us to reach out to Homeland Security to bring them in to have naturaliza naturalization classes and to also help parents understand the process. So each of our CESs that are um, the parent-facing individuals at the school, they are aware of how to get parents access to that because that is something that we need to be aware of. Thank you. Student learning requires holistic supports. Wraparound services must be systematically provided for children and families in order to support learning, i.e. GED and ESL classes, wraparound service, and a parent resource center. So the parent resource center, um, it would be beneficial if we can have a center for parents to be able to come to so they can have access to technology, they can fill out uh, applications, do job search, and also to get the support that they need to, to provide learning at home with their children. And to be able to make copies and do the things they need to do to uplift themselves and empower themselves as well. All right, um, let's give them a round of applause. And while I'm up, up here uh, just gathering notes, part of what my task is, um, after all of this work, uh, this present, these presentations tonight, is I have to formulate all of the recommendations plus everything else that we've been thinking about during the course of this year, but in particular in the last three months, and then present this to the board uh, in the public uh, for them to actually vote on the new strategic plan. And, the goal is to have a one-year plan, but embed in there the strategies of the next 10 years. So technically, it would really be a 10-year plan that we would want the board to be considering. A couple of thoughts. You know, I mean, in this situation, these two co-conveners, one represents the, uh, the school district, that is Ms. Noel, and then obviously Ms. Richardson represents an external partner, but obviously having been an incredible teacher here in our district as well. Um, just as both of you know about curriculum and curriculum writing, there is this thing called writing curriculum for learning at home. So that what we would do is actually provide opportunities for parents to actually make sure that they're continuing, uh, not that parents don't do this, but specific strategies that we would want them, uh, their children to be doing at home with their parents. So thoughts about if we actually did something like that. I think that would be great. Uh, board member Bledsoe, along with the other board members, uh, asked us to meet with Crayola today. So we had the opportunity to meet with uh, Crayola, and they had some really great programming for students to have uh, three pro uh, project-based lessons to take home, and you can bring back that artifact, and the school principal, school leaders can hang it up, and it just shows the continuum of the school community connection. Um, Whip, oh, sorry. I would say from my experience um, as a high school English teacher, um, what I found is that when the reading materials are of high interest, then organically students, uh, parents become involved. I had instances where, I, where I, we were reading uh, novels that were of particular interest, uh, and um, I would, of course, ask the student, where's your book, where's your book? And I had occasions where they would say, my mom, I can't get it from my mom. And that's because it was high interest reading material. So I think on the secondary level uh, in particular that um, we have to be sure that we're engaging students in material that they relate to. So one of the things that the district used to provide were GD and GD, GD in Espanol for adults, not only for parents, but just for members of the community. Um, are there, within the work that you have already done with these um, members uh, that have assisted on this um, a round table, any conversations about identifying other needs that either parents have indicated that they have with regards to like learning how to use technology better, you know, particular math skills, things of that nature. Um, what I would be very interested in getting from um, both of you is a report back of what would be 
other areas of interest where uh, parents would actually um, want for us to afford them. And then part of my strategy would be to reallocate the resources to make that happen. There are a number of principles that are um, in the room uh, right now, and part of the strategy would be to create in every single ward in the city, once again, GD for anyone who wants to get their high school diploma, GD in Espanol if in fact you don't speak English uh, and Spanish is your primary language, and then uh, um, something that I did at Horton which was provide Spanish for people who don't speak Spanish so that they can actually learn a second language just for job opportunities, things of that nature. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're balanced in everything that we do and that we're worrying about everybody. And sometimes what we do is we worry about everyone who doesn't speak English, but we need to actually worry about the actual people who do speak English to make sure that we're affording them job opportunities. Okay? So if I could get a list of that, even if you just email the group, say, hey, what are some other thoughts? I'm going to do the same brainstorming with the principals. We will, the only difference will be that schools will be allowed to figure out what their own communities need. Um, but we want to create kind of like a gen general list of something to consider. Like real easily, learning how to use a computer, that's something that I just think off the top would obviously, obviously be helpful. Uh, let's give them both a big round of applause. Thank you. So our next conveners is from early childhood, Samantha Lot Velez and Joe Delafe for our community partner. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of everyone who participated in the Early Childhood Roundtable, uh, we want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, district planning process. Some of our participants are here tonight, and if you could, can you kindly stand? Say hello to everybody. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, early childhood care and education is the first building block upon which the rest of the district school system stands. This is especially true in cities like ours, where so many disadvantaged children, <clears throat> particularly in relationship to uh, their suburban counterparts, uh, need the, help in, uh, the, uh, the additional help in the earliest years. So uh, while we will not say that this is the most important uh, issue that you hear about tonight, we will say that it is as critical as any other. To take us through the highlights, I want to introduce uh, your director, uh, the wonderful director of early childhood, in the school district, Samantha Lot Velez. Thank you, Joe. And greeting Superintendent Leon, board members, and North community. Our first highlight is a very powerful one. Ongoing and purposeful collaboration with community partners to begin the development of a system to ensure children from conception to age three receive the necessary supports to best prepare them to be ready to learn when they enter preschool. So we really highlight a collaboration with community partners and children entering preschool being ready to learn. There are many agencies out here servicing our North children and their families. Bridging the services is key to ensuring that children from the womb get the care that they need so that they can be ready to learn when they enter preschool. As a community, we should have our touch point on every baby the moment that they're born and immerse our babies and their families with the supports that they need. These sh supports should be coordinated with intention and they should be measurable. Ongoing and purposeful collaboration with community partners can achieve this goal. The second highlight is in the center. It is examine and cultivate the preschool portfolio with enhanced enrollment and facility plans and an equitable and sustainable preschool funding plan that ensures adequate supports for preschoolers, schoolers, I'm sorry, in all developmental domains. So we really highlighted here ad adequate support for preschoolers in all developmental domains. The city's early care landscape is vast. Families, families are serviced in homes through family child care, in private centers through center-based programming, and also in our public schools. Even with all of these options, there still remains children who live in the city that are not being serviced. 
We want to ensure that children who live in the city of Newark have the option to enroll in high quality preschool programs no matter what part of the city they live in. This will require a keen review of the current enrollment demands and input in the development of the district's facility plan for the next decade. In addition, we need to take a deep look at the current funding streams that support preschool programming. We need to communicate and collaborate with our legislators who can help us make the right changes to ensure that funding is equitable and that funding requirements promote the success of all children and families who live in the city. Our third highlight is redefining the instructional vision from age three to grade three, which is very much aligned with, your, with the Clarity Clarity um, 2020 vision. It has a focus on a seamless transition that supports the whole child and ensures that all children are reading by grade three. Our roundtable team agreed that while phonological awareness and phonemic awareness are key to a child being able to read by grade three, what is also key to the comprehension are the interactions children have with peers and adults, the environments in which they live and thrive, and the experiences they make meaning of as they navigate through the world. Joe? Thank you, Samantha. Uh, everyone in this room knows the impact of poverty and other social and economic conditions on healthy child development, conditions that effectively create an achievement gap that can lead to lifelong struggles. A high quality zero to eight system can close this gap and give children of Newark their right to an equal opportunity in life. This is why early childhood is not just an educational imperative, but it is an equity and social justice issue. It is why early childhood needs attention and must be fully and seamlessly integrated into the district system, its mindset, and access to resources. High quality early childhood programming lays the foundation for happy and inquisitive children, and in the larger picture, it is an essential tool in combating generational poverty and eliminating the school to prison pipeline. Thank you. So one of the things that we used to have in place was this document that said, here's a snapshot of what a three-year-old is supposed to know. So by the, by the time a baby turns age three, there are several thousand words that they actually need to know, right? So that way, we create this, we recreate this document, and we say by, you know, second grade, this is what your baby is supposed to know. And we produce that by fifth grade, by eighth grade, by whatever grade, you know, 11th grade in high school, um, we begin to then help educate the parents as to what are some of the things that they need to do. So one of the things that you did was focus on what occurs before age three. So that's the area that this district has never played in, right? We may have talked bad about, oh, the child didn't come to school ready, but in terms of doing something about it. And so what we're saying is all the way from conception, when the baby is in that womb, we're gonna start to begin pr and provide services to that mommy and the dad to uh, make sure that they're educated. Whatever family is defined by that little baby that's gonna be born, we know that he or she is gonna be born a genius. And then we can't be the reason why they're not. So by age three, when they enter in our buildings, we wanna make sure that they're able to read by grade three. So we know that out of Chicago, grades three, six, and nine are critical towards defining prior to dropping out characteristics that a child um, um, has. In terms of the age three to grade three focus, um, were there just any other thoughts about why those grades as opposed to fifth grade? Or are we clear that it's three to three? Here we go. Yes, so the roundtable team, um, when we talked about the age three to grade three, we, we talked about the fact that during those developmental stages is when 
the children's um, brains are developing the most, right? And so we wanna make sure that we're helping them so that they can get uh, the proper brain development that they need. Once they get to about age eight, um, it can potentially be too late if we're not providing the supports they need, specifically crisis intervention support. So a lot of children experience trauma and when that trauma is not dealt with in a proper way, it can mess up the development of the brain. And so we know the community that we live in and we know that a lot of our children that come into our school system are living in poverty and along with poverty come other ills that Joe spoke about here today. So when as a classroom teacher and as school leaders, we need to be cognizant of that. And so when we're making decisions, not just about what happens in the classroom, but in developing curriculum, we need to make sure that we are clear on the development of the child. So we've been spending a lot of time this year, as you know, Superintendent Leon, um, working with uh, school leaders on transforming the way they think about early childhood in the work of early childhood. And what we have been doing is really going back to the basics. What do we know about children? Because when you walk into a classroom, you're not teaching curriculum, you're teaching children. So we need to walk through the door knowing if this is a five-year-old, a classroom full of five-year-olds, what do we know about five-year-olds in their development? And how are we then planning lessons or selecting curriculum based on what we know about their development? When we go into a classroom full of seven and eight year olds, guess what? There's different things happening. They're developing differently. Their behaviors are different. The way they respond to the world is different. And so when we're in the classroom, we need to look at that. A lot of research shows, and, and I know there was some recent research from NEAR that really shows that what's happening right now in the landscape of education is not necessarily addressing the development of children and that in many cases we've gotten so focused on testing that we've lost sight of what's really important in the development of our children. So we have to go back to that and look at the components of the day, how much time are children spending making choices uh, versus being alone. Like we, some of the data show that in an eight-year-old classroom they spend most of their time doing independent work. But we know that eight-year-olds love to be in groups and they love to interact with their peers. So that's not developmentally appropriate. And really redefining what is developmentally appropriate because we've used that language for so long that it's kind of becoming cliche, but it really is, it, 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 there is a definition to it. So going back and re-educating um, classroom staff so that they again are realizing that these are children in front of them that will turn into um, adolescents and young adults and in every stage, even up to high school, they need to know walking through the door um, where is where are these children and how can I support them in every decision that I make? May I add two things quickly? Um, one is, is that um, we know that early childhood, that is preschool for three and four year olds works. Uh, it's what all the near and other studies have shown. And it's a system that's in place, but it needs to be maintained and supported strongly. And because m the majority of children in this program are in provider programs, too often it has been treated as a stepchild sort of of the system, and it needs to be fully integrated. And that's what we mean when we say that. It needs to be part and parcel. We are partners, and that needs to be uh, a part because the job that we do, uh, as well as the, uh, the district's preschool classrooms, sets the stage for how well children will continue to do. Uh, the second thing is, is that while there's a preschool system in place, there's no zero to three system in place across the city. So we're effectively talking about building something entirely new, which is probably not just a district effort, but a citywide effort, a health systems effort, et cetera. What we do know is that brain development is at its greatest growth in the years prior to two years old. And if children don't get proper attention, their brain gro growth is stunted. So that by the time they do get to pre preschool, they're already behind in another way. Um, I can tell you that we have an early Head Start program uh, it would be wonderful if we had early head start across the entire city and all the resources that brought. Uh, but what we do know is that the children in our preschool, the 70% of the children who exceed expectations, developmental milestone expectations, came through the early head start program. So they've been getting attention and support from zero to three before they even got to three and four, and it shows out in the data in terms of their progress. So how we can build a zero to three system 
is something you know to be uh, taken up on. Well, I mean, you had a couple of really important things in the head, right? The majority of the babies that are three and four years old are not in Newark's schools. They're in Newark's provider sites. And what has happened is, and the incredible work, and the, the reason why you know we could have picked several other uh, provider leads to be uh, a co-convener. We, we picked ICC because of the awesome and incredible work that you've done on multiple levels. Part of what we wanna teach everyone in the city is that the way that we're gonna get to where we are going to go is because we're actually collaborating with people who actually get it done. So I just wanted to mention that. But more importantly, I think that you highlight ex an extremely important point. Babies are in these provider sites, and then where do they go? And then if we're not a location that's worthy of them, then they may actually get to not be serviced well ever. So this school district is committing through this work and this strategic plan that that's from right, very, very much behind us, that there will be a, a, an incredible relationship between the providers and the school district of the sharing of resources of which we have more than you all but that you all are demonstrating from sites to sites that you are getting it right. We have four centers in this city that were uh, a mastermind uh, that Dr. Janie and I thought of um, that we know will work. It's just, it has been misinterpreted over the years. So we will have five uh, early child childhood centers, one in every single one of the wards that will be models of excellence. But one of the things that we will do prior to making those be like that is look at sites like yours and countless others from other providers because your models are ready. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will have the North Board of Education Roundtable, Dr. Shakira Harrington. So Dr. Harrington, before she uh, starts, I know that there are a number of other uh, board members that entered uh, into the room after the president. So I saw the vice president, Dawn Haynes, the honorable Dawn Haynes. <laughs> the honorable Reginald Bledsoe. <laughs> the honorable Yambeli Gomez. <laughs> and the newly appointed, the honorable Adorian Murray Thomas. making sure that I have addressed all of the board members. Yes, and I see a number of principals, members of executive staff, thank you for being here, I appreciate you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so I had the opportunity to engage with the employees of the district. So I'm gonna start with the central office employees first. And one of our highlights was that they were um, optimistic and excited about reviewing and analyzing the actual attendance data and test data that helped them re-envision their roles as part of our ecosystem. So it was foreign to them to look at just data. That was never an expectation for them. And so to even have that opportunity, it was different for some of them. Some of them did not want to initially look at the data, but when they were sort of forced, you know, encouraged, and actually collaborated with each other they, were, they then embraced that opportunity to say, wow, I never knew what my role was without, in, as far as impacting student achievement and attendance for the district. Um, Can so, you just clarify for people in the room, when we say central office and attendance and test data, one of the things that we've done very aggressively during the course since the start of this administration has been saying, here's what the attendance is at the schools from last year, here's the span of four years of uh, student achievement data, right? We've been clear, this yes. is what the data says. What was occurring with, when you said the central office employees, so we're talking about various what people? Okay, so we were talking about various departments, like you had the budget department, you had food services, you had the nursing department. Every person that is considered a central office employee at 765 Broad Street or other uh, areas outside of the school, they were considered security services. Carpenters, part, facilities. It, yes, it was every employee outside of that classroom, to be honest with so you. So anyone not in a school Two building. Two full rooms, yes. Even the, no, yes. Anyone that was not inside of a school. So it was two, actually two rooms. 
um, of employees that actually, for the first time, looked at what attendance data was. For the, the I think it was four year longitudinal. And analysis. I want you to get into the the obvious highlights from those conversations, mm -hmm. but I want to kind of put that in everyone's head. So imagine for a moment, I'm an electrician, and this room needs lights. Why does it need lights? So that everyone can see. And so if I don't understand what's going on in the classroom, see, I don't have to teach math, but I have to know that if I'm an electrician, I'm very important so that y'all can see the math. I have to make sure that the smart board is up. I am a critical role player in the conversation. And if they're not aware what attendance is, if they're not aware how the kids are doing in our schools, they might actually think that it's okay for the lights to be out because guess what? They don't know if children are learning or not. And that's just one example of, you know, why an electrician, can you imagine food service people? Can you imagine why we want to make sure the kids are eating well? Sometimes that may be the only meal that they get. So we want to make sure that what's on the plate is worthy of being nourished in their bodies. So the central office staff not knowing what's going on is not what this administration is about. Well, Superintendent Leon pretty much summed it up, my highlight number two, <laughs> pretty much. Um, because they shared their multiple perspectives, just that, the nursing, the, um, the opportunity to be able to share out and say, well, this is how nursing impacts the education and attendance of students in our building and the student test scores. This is how facilities impact. Um, the grants department, um, they wrote out so many different perspectives about what we can do to make sure that they, their department and the rest of our district really understands how to embrace our students, our communities, and what is going on at the school level. So it was very powerful for the central office employees to have this opportunity. Um, and to continue to build that connectivity, I highlight number three, between central office and the school levels, um, yeah, the school level needs. So that basically ended the central office perspective of... Um, Since I interrupted a bit, can you share with the group <laughs> what happens at those monthly meetings? Well, our monthly meetings is professional development. Um, to be very honest with you, they're learning about data. They're learning uh, continuously about what is going on in our district. Um, and it's shared out with them. And they're actually required to discuss it amongst each other and, and how they're going to bring it back to their departments and how that impacts um, student achievement in our district. So it's all interconnected. and they they're then again held responsible. Like you still have a responsibility to the students in, of, of, at their school level as far as your role is, even though it's at 765 Broad Street. One last thing. Um, one of the things that occurred early on in these uh, meetings, they played a role in their, their evaluation tool. Absolutely. Okay, another share that. Again, uh, another professional development opportunity to be able to see where the various uh, rubrics, indicators, and what look for's were part of their evaluation system, and with the expectation um, and the rating scale itself, they knew what their responsibility and expectations were. Yes, there might, there might be people in this room who are unaware. While we rate uh, assistant superintendents evaluate principals, yes. principals evaluate everyone in their school, vice principals, yes. teachers, you know, teacher aides, security, custodial workers, custo head custodians, they do that the folks in central office weren't getting evaluated. That they were very clear through, the, again, professional development of our staff, what the expectation was when they got their evaluation rubric and the, the form itself, and then how they were going to be evaluated and by who. Yeah, I'm just sharing that a lot of people in here may have thought that the central office employees were getting evaluated. Their first evaluation is actually happening this school year. Yeah, I think it was at the mid-year, right? That's right. Yeah. So just so that everyone knows, everyone is being held accountable in this school district. So then I had another opportunity to work with our principals and our teachers. And so the highlight for uh, the principals and the teachers was about establishing an ongoing process for engaging principals and teachers in the design, the implementation, and the monitoring of system-wide changes. They wanted to be part of it um, for the past, okay. They felt, 
over time that they did not have a voice, a true voice. So it was gonna be done, yes, we'll be part of it, but are our thoughts really gonna be part of this plan? And so they felt empowered again. This whole process, everyone was feeling empowered by just being able to voice their opinions. Um, highlight two, revise and develop policies that guide principals, teachers, parents, and students that provide clear expectations and procedures in all aspects of school operations and culture. So they wanted support, additional support in this area because each person was the CEO of his or her own building and they were doing their own thing. That was the reality. So now it's under local control. We want to be able to make sure that we're following state and re regulations and guidelines and we need support and guidance in that. And then creating a strong home to school partnership for the success of the students in the district. Um, again, holding parents accountable for and bringing them into the school more often and making sure that that connection was made for curriculum and home to school, the work that was needed and bringing the parents in to support student learning. So our leading, leading consideration, engaging and growing our own. They really, really felt empowered to and really wanted to talk about the teacher evaluation tool and engaging teachers in that process. Um, and then offering teachers opportunities for growth and systemizing the teacher lead program. That will end my in Milk Board of Education employee portion of the roundtable. So next, this one was actually my favorite one. To, it really was. Um, it was personable. Um, it was very intimate, robust conversation. And the parents came up with some ideas that I was just like, wow, powerful. And, so, and I always ask, I wonder why Superintendent Leon wanted me on the parent one. Okay, let, let's slow it down then. Okay. Um, t everyone to your title. Tell everyone your title. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of the South and the West Ward Schools. Where were you born? I was born in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> Repeat my elementary school where you attended. Hawkins Street School where I yes. graduated. Um, <laughs> we Hawkins Street School, baby. Go, go. <laughs> um, how many children do you have? I have two. There are beautiful twins, are they not? Yes, they are. What school district are they in? Newark Public Schools. Okay. <laughs> so the parents um, really wanted to just highlight, engage the Newark Board of Education, New Jersey Transit, the City of Newark, and the district partners to coordinate and collaborate about the transportation concerns and challenges for the students and families of our Newark Board of Education. And when I talked to you about their um, the leading consideration, I was just like, this is powerful because you just, you didn't think of it. Educator, room full of educators, and this is something that we just did not think of, and it was just fantastic. Um, so they had um, ideas about student access to um, access cards, you know, revising and revamping bus schedules and routes to accommodate our various families, um, bus lanes during peak hours for our students. Um, it was just so many varied uh, ideas uh, for the transportation. Highlight two was to screen potential candidates for hire to the Newark Board of Education for the cultural and other biases and train current employees in cultural competence and sensitivity to the various cultures and learning modalities of the students of the Newark Board of Education. Um, teachers in front of our students, they really, really wanted to, under, to make sure that there were teachers in front of our students who understand and empathize with our students, but they don't lose that expectation of excellence. So that was key in our discussion. And then highlight number three was Explain the ladder. Explain the ladder. Because we want people who will see our babies and know how to respect them from religious reasons. Yes. Cultural reasons. Uh, cultural reasons. Cultural reasons. Um, right? But what do we, when we celebrate, to celebrate their beautifulness. Yes. Right? Yes. Talk about the expectations part of it. Why so, is that important? So you want people who are going to stand in front of our children and have that expectation that despite what anyone may think about your culture or the fact that you have a learning disability, that you still can maintain and exceed and excel beyond measure. So that is the expect that's what the parents desired for the teachers because they felt that some teachers were not 
um, did not exhibit that. They did not have that passion, that commitment, that love for their child who was different. Every single child is different. And they, wow. they wanted teachers in front of them who understood and still, no matter what, had that high expectation for their baby. So like, you already know this, my, of my three older sisters, the youngest one, um, she, when she, uh, she married an Egyptian and she converted to Islam and she was covered head to toe. So an example of that would be if somewhere, someone is walking into a cafeteria wearing a hijab, you don't tell her to take that off your head, right? Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. Exactly it. Really understanding the, just the, the students we service, the students in front of us. Um, highlight three, promoting positive messages and beliefs through various creative activities at the district and school levels to promote positive beliefs and ensure that everyone feels valued and a sense of belonging. So again, they wanted to make sure that we feel valued and that we're being heard. In our leading considerations, collaborate and engage the ecosystem. I'm excited about it. So the parents came up with the idea to develop an extensive transportation plan for the students of the school district. Um, collaborate extensively with the colleges and universities about the teacher education programs in order to hire and recruit qualified teachers to teach in Newark. Implement a campaign to build a culture of safety, belonging and value across the district with our schools, our communities, and various cultures. And then this was great, create an app that will allow the district another form of communication with the district staff, family, communities, and stakeholders. So something with the app was more of, you have school closings, you have this event at this very, this school. So it's not just paper, everyone is technology savvy. So they really came up with these various ideas as we um, ended our round table. Any questions? So next, we will bring up our very own deputy, Dr. Fitzhugh and Dr. Sherry Ann Butterfield. Dr. Butterfield. Dr. Fitzhugh. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are we all doing? So as we walk into uh, 765 and LL70, I'm gonna use that Dr. Butterfield for I just a minute. All right. <laughs> so I thought the most powerful thing for our partners was for them to see all the data from high school graduation rates, from our attendance rates that the superintendent speaks out each month to our esteemed board members in our community. We also looked at park data, which is aggregated, predicated on what? all the different um, subgroups that are evident within our school system. And when they walked into the room, Dr. Butterfield, they were like, you know what? We're transparent. I think that's what's most important, that there was transparency in the room, they saw all the data, and that there was not gonna be a, a climate in the room where they could not take pictures, they couldn't speak their truth, and that they were going to give us what was necessary for us to build the North Board of Education to an optimum of excellence. Dr. Butterfield. So the transparency was clear. It was also meant that the New York Public Schools is ready to be transformed. And our partners who have been, some who have been at the table for a very long time, others who have just joined, were thrilled, invigorated, excited by the potential moving forward. I'm really glad that we are following the parent roundtable because our group also came up with many of the similar ideas. The app was huge. The app was also talking about how we deal with issues of attendance that we'll get into shortly, right? And so thinking about the importance, if we're all thinking the same thing, the importance of implementing some of these things with the approval of Superintendent Leon, because if we're all thinking about it, that means it's important to all of us. I also wanna thank not just our partners who attended, but really think about the importance of our dedication to our students, children, and to the adults, because that came across very clearly as well, that we need to attend to the adults who are raising our children, both who are parents and who work for the school district. So we will start with highlight number one. Situate learning in the context of our children's and families' lives. We have to understand the experiences of our children to ensure we provide them with the sound teaching and learning models. We agree with that, right, everyone? All right, we have to keep in mind the home environments as well as the social norms 
within the community. We, that can't be absent from our hearts and minds as our teachers walk into the classrooms, our principals walk into their buildings, and as Superintendent Leon and myself walk every building in the district. It is important to note the breakdown of the family structure as well. We have to be resilient and make sure that our children can be resilient in that work. And just to follow up that resilient and a breakdown of family structure does not mean deficient or defective, all right? It does not mean deficient or defective. We are cultivating talent, again, following up after Assistant Superintendent. And cultivation of talent means we need to recognize challenges does not mean defeat. It's a challenge. That means you can surpass it. So we need to really keep thinking about that and moving forward. We have winners, right, Dr. Butterfield? We have winners all day, every day. All teachers in schools, Dr. Butterfield? All day, every day. All right, now. <laughs> Highlight number two, understand the various factors that affect student attendance in neighborhoods across the city. We talk about their holidays, their travel plans, parents not realizing missed days equal missed instruction. There is that very important family gathering that you want your child to be a part of. You don't know and understand what they're missing when that happens. How do, but how do we have that conversation while valuing your culture and valuing your experience? What is critical is that we want all of our children in the city of North to compete with their peers in West Orange, in Milburn, in Summit. Do we agree? We need to make some noise for that because that's what's critical. Because our children can. We've given them the tools to become successful and we have to continue to push that, um, that envelope pedagogically in all of our um, school buildings holistically. Highlight number three. Provide systematic and adaptive professional development opportunities for staff. We know what that means, don't we? The one size fits all model doesn't work, does it? No, nope, it doesn't work. We have to make sure that we have individualized instructional approaches for our instructional leaders in the classroom settings, in our buildings. And we have to make sure, and my role as a deputy superintendent over academics, is to make sure that those special assistants understand how to differentiate instruction for teachers across the city because the one-size-fits-all model does not work. Seminars for teachers, district, and principal meetings. So I'm going to talk about our principal meetings with just a minute, Superintendent Leon, because our superintendent leads them because he's an instructional leader. Any superintendent that does the critical work should know pedagogy and practice from front to back, left and right. He takes and he um, gives the um, pedagogy and practice to all principals each and every single month on a continuum. I'm learning every month. Central office staff, are you learning every month? We have it. They need to say that a little bit differently, right, Ms. Leon? <laughs> Grade level meetings as well as professional learning communities We'll use existing supports to plan and develop practice. We need to be in classrooms. Right, assistant superintendents? Dr. Santos, Ms. Fuentes, you agree with me? All right, we've got to be in classrooms. We have to make sure that what's happening and our expectations that yield the success of Clarity 2020 is going to be evident through your work as assistant superintendents. One of the things that's really important for people to understand is that Every child in every school, every single classroom, if you're a second grader, that teacher across all of our schools has to be teaching the students at or about the same things. What's different is that every school has different children. And so what our staff does is then meet the needs of the students where they are. They don't say, oh, you know, you're in seventh grade and you're really doing third grade math. And so I'm going to teach you just third grade math so that by the end of seventh grade, you're at still third grade math. Part of what we have to do is understand that while all of the children throughout the city are in fact different, that they can be successful if they're taught well. And so our strategy is to make sure that we're providing all of the PD that our teachers need, the right resources, which I know Dr. Fitzhugh is going to get into um, in a little bit, uh, to make sure that they are actually successful. So professional development, the right resources, make sure that we're putting our money where we know the research shows it works, and that'll help us get out of the hole. Just to put this full um, circle, Superintendent Leon, if I can, teachers have to be at the table when we're looking at those curricular resources. In just a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about our textbook adoption, which is taking place this week in the areas of mathematics and English language arts. The teachers, after so many years, are in the forefront of this work. 
So we should give that a big round of applause as well. Our administrators are at the table as well, and you're going to see a big presentation in terms of what we're doing in terms of changing the climate in, um, pedic um, in terms of the instructional uh, supports within our district. Dr. Butterfield. And in terms of our leading consideration, we are looking at the ongoing collaboration, input, and feedback. Our community roundtables as well as community meetings have allowed for voices to be heard. Ooh, next slide, stop. You were listening. You were listening. <laughs> I'll start again. The community roundtables as well as community meetings have allowed for voices to be heard and should continue as we structure the final components of Clarity 2020, as well as the setup for the 10-year strategic plan entitled The Next Decade. And the beauty of our particular roundtable is really having our partners think about how do we leverage the resources that our partners bring to bear? How do we utilize higher ed institutions? How do we utilize organizations like NJPAC, Schools That Can, KIPP, Opportunity Youth Network, and really talk about how do we leverage our resources so that we may, in some areas we need duplicative re action, but some places we really need to maximize our impact and breadth. And so really talking about how we, as partners, hold each other accountable to getting this work done and getting it done very well. Next round table will be the philanthropy round table. Janet Chavis, Executive Director of Federal Programs and Grants, the North Board of Education, and Barbara Reisman. Let's give them a round of applause this evening, please. from the Mar Charitable Foundation. I just want to give uh, Dr. Butterfield a big round of applause because she embodies all of the partners in this conversation who have been working really, really hard and leading a lot of important work while we allowed them to do it. <laughs> and we're in partnership, which means we work collaboratively with each other and make things happen just like this incredible duo in front of us right now. We have a tough act to follow. Y'all see that lady right there to the right with the blue? Let me tell you, I, I only really met her during the course of uh, the uh, month or so prior to my start, and then obviously much more in July, and um, a brilliant woman is she. So I, I'm Barbara Reisman with the Mar Charitable Foundation. I'm here in place of Mateos, who's traveling, but who's at Panasonic, and who led this with the capable uh, partnership of Janet Chavis, who has been with the district for a very long time and therefore has very deep knowledge of what has happened and can happen in this district. And I just want to offer a little context for philanthropy. There are a lot of funders in Newark who have a deep commitment to the public schools here and long-standing connections and have made long-standing commitments. There have also been, in the recent past, some of you may remember, some other funders who've come in and had some very clear agendas of their own that they wanted to accomplish. Um, they did not always do that in consultation either with the district or with people in the community. Um, and most of them are not here anymore. So um, I'm only speaking for myself here, but I, I think that we're moving in a different direction now, and th that's what this uh, round table came up with. So we had three key principles. Um, the first one is coordinated planning with the district, that we will identify possible gaps in both funding and human capital and we'll find a way to plan together to address those gaps. This is not to say that philanthropy funders can make up for the gaps in resources that the district may be experiencing, but we may be able to work with the district to help address some of those gaps and to use some of our other influence to ensure that the appropriate resources are made available to the district. The second point is transparency. Um, we want to map existing funding sources, identify the, the, those funders who are interested in Newark, identify new ones who may be interested, clarify what our funding priorities are. As, as you may know, 
every foundation has its own set of priorities, but hopefully they are it's somewhat aligned with what the district's priorities are. And to, I, to be very transparent about what we are funding and how we are doing that in partnership with the district. And the third principle is alignment, that there would be a uh, we have a funders group that focuses on education funding in Newark, and we um, want to work very closely with the district um, and find ways where we can share information together and align our work so that we are coordinating and working together towards a shared set of goals. And that brings me to the last point, which I don't know who's got the clicker here, but the, um, the ongoing collaboration create a public compact that identifies common goals and establishes shared commitments to working together towards those goals. I think that would be a real uh, change in the way that we've operated in Newark and the way philanthropy operates in some other places. We want to be open and transparent about our goals and, sh and work together with the district and with parents and teachers and professionals to make sure that we're moving forward. Good, good afternoon, everyone. And I just wanted to add that um, one of the things we talked about was creating a database. We had um, learned that there was a database at one point of funding sources of different um, avenues and um, resources that were available to the district and various funders that had an arm in programs that the district was running. But what we learned was that while um, the funders group operated in one way, the grants office, we were not aware, we were not intricately involved, and we were not aware of the many of the resources that were out there. So what we talked about was uh, maintaining or um, uh, reinstating the database and keeping it um, up to date and providing access to those people on the outside who kind of wanted to just get a general idea of the uh, different resources that are available to the district. Because oftentimes, people will say, well, you've got this billion dollar budget, so why would you need to look for additional resources? Doesn't Newark get enough? But we know that a billion dollars goes but so far. And on an, and another point, with the funders, their funds might be a lot more flexible than the federal dollars are. So one of the things that came up was a suggestion to use some of the funders' dollars as startup uh, funds, seed money, so that programs that we would like to, innovative programs that we would like to start or test out, um, and as those programs are rolled out, if they, appear, if they appear to be sustainable, then we can certainly use title dollars, other federal dollars, to support those programs and augment those programs as long as there's some research and some uh, and a backbone um, involved, and let's see. So we we really tried to pack a lot of things into our three highlights because uh, we knew that the conversation was rich, it was it was bold, and with our group we are hoping to have those difficult conversations, to talk about what is working, what working and to make sure that the district uses those resources and does not leave anything on the table. Thank you. Uh, just before you finish, um, when we convened this round table, uh, there were questions. Why are you con convening a philanthropy round table? What is this round table going to do? So it's obviously a conversation that hasn't happened previously or in a while between the school district and the philanthropic community. So I would like to hear you just talk a little bit about what the experience was like bridging this gap and for you to offer one or two immediate, immediate next steps that need to happen in order to maintain the work that began during the last three months. Well, I, I think that there was a sharing of information between the funders and uh, the district in the person of Dr. Travis. Um, and uh, I think that that was a first step. I mean, in the past, there was a lot of 
individual conversations between individual funders and certain people in the district, but it wasn't always as um, open and um, wasn't always shared either among the funders or with the district. That's one. I think the other model that we have here is we do have the position of philanthropic liaison in the city of Newark that was established uh, during the prior mayor's administration and has been continued under Mayor Baraka. And it has been a very productive relationship because that person is in City Hall and understands the mayor's priorities and is able to work with philanthropy both in Newark and outside of Newark to enhance the resources that are available. And I think something similar um, might be a, a positive step forward for the district and, and could also enhance the district and city uh, relationship around those philanthropic initiatives. And I know, <coughs> excuse me, for me, um, it was really eye-opening. We sat in the room and realized that uh, we were the new people at the table. This group, many of these um, participants had been meeting, knew each other, had conversations, were uh, familiar with the resources that they brought to the table. And so for us to sit there and realize that, wow, okay, so this is really, this is a group that has been active for a while. And um, we realized that it almost was though we were operating in parallel silos. And so um, there are things and tools and instruments and processes that we've put in place to ensure that the district uses those federal funds and those um, uh, discretionary funds in such a fashion so that we can monitor and manage those things. And we realize that while they are offering um, the district opportunities to apply for grants um, and, and programs, that we can provide support to, we can collaborate and we can also be that lead person or that contact person when there's a question or when you don't know who to call because the district is so large and there are so many entities. And we, as the uh, bedrock of the philanthropic components of the district, we can assist wherever, um, wherever, wherever we're needed because all of us, well, uh, the most of us in the office are um, instructional. We have some fiscal people, but many people think that because we've learned to wrap our arms around the instructional, I mean the fiscal pieces, that we are primarily operational. But we are instructional because in order to really manage your dollars efficiently, you really need to have both sides of the equation together at the table. I wanted to try and draw a picture for everyone. If you all were going that way right now, and you are a philanthropic organization, and just by the example, the district is going that way, then maybe you can understand why we haven't moved as far as we probably should have. When Everyone is trying to do the right thing, but they only understand their thing. Then you work not in a system. So part of the strategy with this um, roundtable was to bring us to the table. And it's important that you understand that when I say us, because the people who have been at the table are very, very concerned. Most of those people uh, don't necessarily live in the city but they have something very important that everyone who is a student in this room right now needs to understand. And those people love our city. And they understand that the education of children is how to help the school system and the city become a whole lot better. And so part of what we're doing is saying, let's move in the same direction. And in moving in the same direction, what we're doing is saying, here are what the needs are. Here are what the needs honestly are. And this is how we move. Um, so the money is just resources, but it, there's a lot of passion that's already there. As I shared, you know, um, Ms. Um, Reisman, through her organization and this district, um, are going to 
hopefully soon, unveil. There's a lot of incredible work that has occurred in the South Ward, a lot of incredible work. Um, but we actually want to see evidence of success. And so there is a, a project that's actually um, in the process of being unveiled in the South Ward that we've been working hard at making happen that I'm just going to be so excited to actually um, be able to announce. Um, there's a, a major event occurring Friday to move it along. And so um, with fingers crossed, that's going to work. So I, I just applaud you and your leadership because you're just, I don't know, just a fabulous person. Um, and talking about fabulous people, I can't let Ms. Chavis just go ahead and have a seat. Um, how long have you been working in the district? Go ahead. Uh, microphone. Three decades. Okay. Three decades. Um, yes. And um, when were you made a, a member of executive staff? Initially, I was made a member of the executive staff under Dr. Janey's administration, and then um, I uh, returned back to my position uh, with the general population. Um, <laughs> and it was as a result of <laughs> uh, Superintendent Leon tapping me to return to the executive team. Right. I've worked with him on a number of occasions. Um, when I was the director of Title I, uh, I was under his leadership. Um, he is one that takes no prisoners. He is one that um, I can't speak enough about him because I respect his work, I respect his vision. I, I'm in awe of his energy and his passion and his ability to work 23 hours. That's what it feels like sometimes, so thank you. All right, well, the purpose of that was to just talk about how proud I am of you, even though we did work closely in 2008, you know, um, your cubby was next to my cubby, so I was able to see what, <laughs> that I could pull you into this uh, hard work. But we cannot have great leaders in our school district not be in important roles. And so you're just, you are supposed to send a message, your appointment was to send a message to everyone in the district that I'm not gonna forget those who know how to get it done. Okay, thank That's you. That's right. Thank you both. Special okay. Education Roundtable, Convener, Carolyn Granado, Executive Director of the Office of Special Education. Good evening, everyone. I had the pleasure of co-convening the special ed roundtables with uh, Dr. Deborah Jennings, who is the executive director of SPAN, and I'm, I'm happy to report that she is out there at a professional development um, opportunity this evening abroad and was uh, not able to be here this evening to co-convene this with me. Um, while doing the uh, special ed roundtables, highlight number one, was, the, was to understand the success of students with disabilities is closely tied to the success of all Newark Board of Education students. As we all know, um, and data informs us, while in, in, while in the general ed setting, students struggling with literacy, language arts, are often the students that are referred for child study team evaluations. Therefore, the changes that must occur Superintendent Leon, lie in the general education program. Most important, importantly and significantly, our literacy program. As we all know, literacy and literate learners unlock, is the key that unlocks all educational opportunities for our children. Can you do me a favor? Because I don't know if everyone heard it right. The key to what's occurring that needs to be fixed in special education is lying, not is a lie, is lying in the general education classroom. See, everyone's thinking, I gotta worry about my baby, and trust me, we need somebody worrying about your baby, so definitely one person being the parent, I'm good, thank goodness. 
So everyone who's a parent advocate for other people's children, thank you so much. Uh, those of you who are worrying about your own babies with an IEP, thank you so much. But while you're worrying about your babies, we're not keeping our eyes on what's going to help them. So the focus is on the general education classroom, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a whole lot of people. Because you're figuring, if my child is in a special education class, I have to worry about the special education class. No, we actually have to worry about the general education class to actually help your baby in, not, in, in those classes as well as the other classes in our schools. On the literacy front, go. Absolutely. With the implementation of a research-based literacy program addressing the literacy needs of each and every student and that understands that professional development and support is needed for each and every literacy teacher, building capacity to unlock the talents in each and every one of our students, the referrals to special education will drastically decrease. <laughs> Highlight number two, eliminate structures and systems that segregate students with disabilities from their typical peers as early as preschool with low expectations for students abound. Past practice, whether intentional or not, believe that by placing our youngest learners in special education self-contained classrooms at age three and four would best serve their needs. However, research has informed us not. Research has informed us that our youngest learners, most of our youngest learners, learn best when they socialize, explore, and learn from and with one another. <laughs> Beginning this academic year, the Office of Special Ed urged parents and practitioners to consider the least restrictive environment for, their, for our youngest learners by placing students in inclusive general ed classrooms, we end the special ed for life pathway for our students. <laughs> Highlight number three. Well, a second. Yes. Sir. So when you go into special ed, you don't just stay there forever? You're not supposed to, sir. Oh, you're not supposed to. So, so you can actually, so, how you get into special education? They do all of these tests, all right? These tests. And then yes. the a, a determination is made that the child is classified. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, how? What's the term that we use to remove that? Inclusion. We declassify. Well, I was declassify. Right. right. So, just because your child has an IEP doesn't mean that that's for life. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Now we also know that there are people who are not in um, the same uh, socioeconomic status as parents in Newark who have an IEP because it provides a benefit to their children when they're taking the SATs and things Absolutely. of that nature, right? Yes. Yes. So what we need to do is make sure that we're always constantly educating our parents yes. as to how we not only provide the service, but exit children out when they're ready for that. Absolutely, absolutely, and support them until they're successful in the mainstream of general education. Highlight number three, provide support and professional development for general educators and school leaders to be able successfully to include and educate students with disabilities in the general ed setting. In order for our students with special needs to achieve and excel alongside their general ed peers, it is necessary to, perverse, to first to provide support to our general educators, student support staff, and especially our school leaders with professional development and support. As we champion and develop our general ed practitioners with strategies that support our special ed learners in the general ed environment, we champion each and every student in that classroom. So tonight, Superintendent Leon, our consideration to you is that as we move forward, that you keep, that we keep the students with disabilities front of mind as we take actions to improve NORC, as we improve the NORC Board of Education, and that in turn, we will improve education for each and every Newark student. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Granado. And for all the, uh, anybody in here who's a, a parent or a friend of a student that actually has an IEP and you've been like, when are they gonna do right by my babies? When are they gonna do right by my babies? When are they gonna do right by my friends? It's happening. Students Roundtable, conveners, Ketsi Rivera, Senior Manager of the North Board of Education, Kalina Berriman, Executive Director of the Abbott Leadership Institute. Now, now while these two ladies and this young man get up there, I know somebody was like, he didn't see students. Where are all the students that are in here? Where are y'all? Come on now. Yeah. Come on now. There we go. You see, that's Arts High School brilliance in the back. Yes. Some, uh, you, you, why you get up? I, I see former board member Ms. King. But you are not a child. Okay, you just stay right there with Ms. King. We do have a board member, Siobhan um, Anderson here. Please, the honorable, please stand so that everyone sees you. Great. All right, y'all ready? I saw Reverend Roundtree, because that's my, I mean, I, I go to church, but when she's in the house, the church is here. Thank you, Reverend Roundtree, for everything that you do for us. All right, good evening, everyone. Wait, before you start, though, yes. you know, there are, <laughs> All of the round tables were important. Yes. And I know that, um, you know, Ms. Delafave just said, you know, the importance of the early childhood round table critical towards it, right? And then the work, because of the work that occurs from the, um, the womb to that cradle, yes. to um, college and careers, mm -hmm. right? Um, but in my work, just as a teacher here and debate coach and then as principal. The, the human beings, teachers helped and administrators helped, don't get me wrong. And there are brilliant administrators in this room that I have only but great expectations for, right? But in the strategy, it has always been my work with kids, that the students were able to help course correct their own schools, Oh, for sure. right? And so you have just been a model of excellence when it comes to helping these young, brilliant minds understand. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. So I didn't want you to start yet without the accolades, but you know, um, in figuring out who were gonna be the two co-conveners here, I knew on my side who I was picking, right? Oh, in terms, wait, no, let me tell you, <laughs> on the district's end, the person who has helped me every single time throughout the six years at University High School was Ketsi Rivera okay. right up there. Well, let's give it up okay. for Ketsi. She did her thing. <laughs> okay, a powerhouse right there. Yes. But I have to tell you, when Lauren Wells thought of this brilliant idea of setting up a co-convener, and we were looking at the round tables and figuring out who, so when she came to the table with the name, I already had the name written down. Okay. Okay? Yes. Because you are what we are talking about when it's about student advocacy. It's not you advocating for kids. That's right. You do that. It's about you teaching the kids how to advocate, advocate for, for themselves. themselves. That's right. Yes, and, and thank you to Superintendent Leon and Dr. Wells for the honor. Thank you to the parents for raising such wonderful young people, and thank you to the young people for being willing to be a part of this process. The roundtable discussion with our young people was not tailored or altered in any way. They analyzed data. They went through the same process as the adults. And it was intense. They challenged us. They came up with brilliant ideas. They, they questioned us about the authenticity of the process. You know, that was very important for them. Will this matter? Will this make a difference? And we wanted Yamin and Michelle to stand up here with us today because they were at every single round table. And they are both brilliant leaders, um, and we really appreciate them. So I'm going to hold, um, turn it over to Ketsi to share the highlights. So I'm, I'm going to go over the highlights, and then I'm going to ask Yamin to add to that, um, because he was not only part of the roundtables, but, and Dr. Wells is going to speak on the I Am The Solution um, conference, which the students were also part of, and a big part of planning in the, as well. So highlight number one, build faculty and staff staff and student relationships and create opportunities for open dialogue to include safety, 
officers, and other people that work with the students, not just the teachers, but everybody who impacts their daily lives. So basically their ecosystem within the school. Highlight number two, integrate student voice in policies that govern them. Greater voice for student board representative. The students continued over and over to say that just having a student representative in the board isn't enough. They want that student to have a voice and a vote. Highlight number three, increase Increase diversity in staff and curricula in all, in all schools and extracurricular activities and in, ensure appreciation of cultures year round. Diversity, 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 which was something that was said in the previous um, committees as well. So I'm gonna have Yamin now take the floor. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> so for highlight one, an example of what building the, what I'm sorry, you know I love you, but you just can't start like that. Can y'all tell, you tell everybody, so the Tournament of Champions <laughs> is an event that occurs at the University of Kentucky, and you have to qualify to go to that competition, okay? So you just can't go to the competition. You had to have gone to debate tournaments and qualified. So he was able to do that, and so he went and competed with 2,000 students, high school students from, from the United States of America. From four different countries also. Oh, my bad. <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. The United States of America and four other countries. And of those 2,000 students, you were ranked. 12th place. Thank you. So I know that people stood up and some of you may have just been a little too tired to do so. So while everyone is taking the seat, you know, I just want to have you reflect for a moment before he starts to speak because he was number 12 in original oratory over 2,000 contestants in the United States of America at the University of Kentucky, even though there were four other countries invited. You're not in Newark, Delaware, people. You're in Newark, New, New Jersey. Jersey. All right, to continue. <laughs> so an example of what build faculty, staff, and students' relationship and create opportunities for open dialogue to include safety officers. Now, when we say safety officers, that's changing the words, the, the wording of a security guard, okay? So we would use words such as safety officers and train the safety officers with content of social and emotional background because as students, we walk in the building every day and when I walk in the building, the first person I see is a security guard. And walking in that building, I need to know that I'm gonna be safe. And if I don't know you as a security guard, then what are you there for? So therefore, that's what that would show. Um, highlight number two. Integrate students' voice in the policies that govern them. Great voice for student broad representatives. So students want to engage in the decisions that ultimately impact our lives, which means our, if we are engaged into those decisions that, that are being made for us, then that means we have a voice for ourselves, and that we know what's going on instead of being told what's going on, which means that will help us as a whole and as a community and as great leaders in the building of schools. Um, highlight number three, increase diversity in staff and curricula in all schools and extracurricular activities and ensure appreciation of culture years around. Now, I like this highlight because as a student, I want to be able to be a part of the extra curriculums that's going on, curricular that's going on, and also create a type of, um, to create So to create a curriculum. Yeah. So like students would be involved, yeah, students would be involved in speaking upon, you know, what it's like and to create in a curriculum for the school instead of, you know, teachers and the principal and other staff in the building. 
Thank you. Sorry. And so I think kind of to sum up what the students kind of all had in common was that they want to feel valued when they enter their building. And they defined value for us. So that means that we want to feel like we are champion for, that we are welcomed, that we are respected, that we are loved, that we are believed in. They want to see themselves and what they learn. They want to gain a greater appreciation for who they are. Um, and they want the people in the building to reflect that. And so the conversation was not pretty, but it was meaningful. And we're very grateful for that. And we want to hand it over to Michelle to give us our final consideration. Good evening. So for our leading consideration, we chose building bridges and relationships. So here we want to create greater and deeper relationships between faculty and students are needed, as well as clarity and expectations and clarity in what motivates teachers and students. Because for us students, we want to feel as though we're connected to our teachers and that our teachers understand us, rather than feeling detached from school as a whole and feel as though we're just a statistic for some greater cause. So one of the things, and I thank you um, to the four of you for the work that you were doing uh, and others that were helping uh, you all that are in this room that are not up on that stage, because I know that uh, it was really important work. We learned this mistake in the creation of great expectations. Uh, my job was to um, uh, deal with the rollout of the plan. and. Um, it's an area of work that I think I do really, really well. And we were ready to present it, and students came to a board meeting and told Superintendent Janie, you're going to roll out a strategic plan. You haven't even asked us about it. And so he was like, well, you're in charge of that. So he's like, you, you better meet with them and you figure it out. So we did. We had several meetings. And even though the plan had been, uh, the work was done, we allowed students to critique it. So they felt appreciated, if you will. Um, the whole idea about being disrespected was kind of um, a little bit watered down because they figured at least we got to, to say something as opposed to just getting a plan that's going to impact our lives forever and we don't even have a copy of it. So in this strategy, what we did as Lauren was leading the strategic planning component of it, our conversations were students must be at the table before we even start. While everyone's thinking, well, what are we going to do? When are you going to do it? That's not how we do in this city. That's why a lot of people come visit here and kind of stay for a little while and really don't know what's occurring in the city and then leave, and we're happy that they do that. Um, because in the process, they don't understand what is Newark. So Newark is a city that doesn't want people to tell them what to do. We don't like that. We don't like that. Um, and we're a, we're a, a city that understands because we have a rich history. We're an old city. A lot of our students don't understand how important Newark is to the world. And so part of what we wanted to do, and then my point to the four of you, but in particular to the to students, is that your voice is always important in this administration. And that our job is to make sure that we put principals in every school who understand that. Understand? I'm not saying that the vice principals are not important. I'm not saying that the classroom teachers are not important. Y'all already indicated that the safety officers are important. So everybody, from food, the food service worker, the cashier, she is important. He's important in the work. Everyone who's an employee, everyone who gets a check has to understand that the reason why they're getting the check is because of the two of you and your classmates that are in this room, as well as students that are representing and supporting you today. So I want you to know that I'm clear on that. One quick question. Um, so I can't get into this part of it, but we're in negotiations with the Newark Teachers Union, and there are great teachers in this room, by the way, uh, with the contract, their next contract. Right? So there's an item that is on the table that I just want to get your initial thoughts on. 
So while the principal is extremely important, no one's gonna improve a, a school without a principal who understands what we need to do. Principals need assistance and support, don't get me wrong, right? Teams of people need to help the principal. Some of those leaders are called classroom teachers, not classroom teachers who wanna be a principal. They actually wanna be a classroom teacher. You know what I mean? However, when it comes to everything that is occurring in the building about the school spirit and pride of the school, everything that occurs after school has to be connected with what occurs in the school. So this whole notion of extracurriculars, which you're, you're thinking about like yearbooks and uh, yearbook clubs and um, uh, there was a list that you were thinking of of additional things. I would love to hear what those items actually you know, are, because if I can include them in the conversations with the negotiations, because while I, I think it's extremely important that students lead, um, obviously we still have a responsibility to you, so we must always have an adult. You can't be in our schools alone, right? But some of you are in schools with adults who have left you alone. Mm -hmm. So part of what my job is, is to create a culture in our school system that is co-curricular, as opposed to saying, this is what you do beyond the school day. What I'm saying is everything that we do must be about the school day, whether it's before school or after school. You with me on that? So uh, Kathy wound up having this title for me at University High School. So she was a world language teacher. She taught Spanish. But after school, she was the student activities coordinator. That was one person in every school who's responsible for managing everything that occurs before the school day starts and as soon as the school day ends. Everything coordinated mm -hmm. through one person that works directly with the principal. What are your thoughts about the importance of, even if you think it makes sense or not, I would love, if you don't think it makes sense, I would wanna talk to you more, but the whole idea about just creating a new position <laughs> called Student Activities Coordinator in our high schools. I, I believe it's a good idea because for a lot of students, there isn't really something after school that they can connect with or something after school that they can understand and are motivated to go to do. A lot of times students are, students are disconnected from the school in general and just end up going home and don't, and don't end up doing something that kind of brings meaning to what they want to do in their life. So having a student activities coordinator will allow for more opportunities to arise where different kinds of clubs and there can even be conversations between the student activities coordinator and the students themselves to develop new clubs that they actually want to be in rather than there being like a set amount of clubs mm -hmm. that already existed before them that doesn't really have anything to do with what they desire going forward. That's right. So, to piggyback on what she said also, that is a great idea because as a student, students can push out new different ideas that, that helps the school in the sense that if it's coming from the student, other students are gonna follow after what that leader that is a student is saying. Like, if for instance, as an example, for me, if I'm in school, if I'm, like today, we had a, all seniors had a meeting today with our principal, and our principal, she, you know, she spoke about our requirements and what expectations we have to meet, but then I remembered that in October, the superintendent had us all together, every senior from, the North Public School District, and he stated to us that we had to also meet his expectations, and that you have to have a 2.5 or greater um, and graduating from high, from your high school class. And I stated that he's gonna take us on a trip. And some students did not remember that. And the principal oh. didn't state it either. So I said, as a leader, and as me being a part of these you know, discussions, I remember that we have to also meet his expectations, not only our, just our principal. Thank That's you. right. You better say that right. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, part of how it has worked here, this is not necessarily like a year ago or something that has occurred a, somewhat, where principals lead their school buildings. And I'm not saying that I disagree with that. I'm just saying they're gonna lead them my way. Okay. One more thing, one more thing. Um, wait, wait, wait. Can you, uh, you're gonna talk again. Can you give these four beautiful people a big round of applause, please? <laughs>
You are 12 of 2,000. You can use the microphone whenever you want to. Go ahead. Um, today is National um, Decision Making Day, and right. I decided to go to Rutgers Newark. Yeah. Uh, he better get a hug. He better go get a hug. Double majoring. Oh, oh, political, sorry. Political, political science and pre law. All right. Thank you. Go get a hug. The Student Supports Roundtable, Mary Lee Harvey, Vice Principal of Science Park High School, North Board of Education, Lakeisha Yuri, Senior Social Worker at the City of Newark. Let's give them a round of applause. So, it was decision day, and I work at Science Park High School. So the attire is because it was decision day, and we had celebrations in the hallway where the students painted on the glass outside my office the colleges that they were going to go to, are going to. So we always dress up in college attire on May 1st. And jeans, Superintendent Leon. <laughs> <laughs> and with that being said. I was going to say, I've never seen you dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, where did you go to school? I did not go to Penn State. OK. I, I had, my niece goes there. And I have a student at school that's going to Penn State. And she was a little nervous, because I said, you know, Penn State is out in the middle of nothing. You have really good football. You have a really good lacrosse team. There are no more frat parties. Um, so, you know, you go out there, you're a little lonely the first couple, couple months till you meet somebody. So I took out my phone, and I said, so, I'm not going to say who it was, so-and-so, this is my niece, Emily. Emily just finished her last exam of sophomore year. So she is going to come home. But now you have a connection at the school. So you have somebody there that you can go talk to. And that's important. So when we talked about our highlights, we talked about conversations. Conversations between people have to happen and people have to listen. If you're not listening, there's nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. So when we talked to the members of the community, they said student support's really bad. It's bad in the city of Newark. It's bad in the Newark Public Schools. Something has to be done to change it. So systems have to be put in place, conversations have to be had, and people have to understand what needs to be done. In order for that to happen, mindsets have to change. We've got to figure out where we're going and how to get there. I've got to explain, or we have to explain, the pathway for you to get to college, for you to go to a career or technical school, for you to get a job and reach Clarity 2020 and come back to speak to the students in the city of Newark. Tell them what the path was, how to get there, what you need to do. If it takes Mary Lee Harvey FaceTiming so that you meet somebody at a school, that's what needs to happen. But we need to have the pipeline, and we need to have the conversations. They're not easy conversations. They are uncomfortable conversations. So that needs to happen, and that's part of highlight number one. We're going to go out. I keep saying where. But I sent an email the other night. So <laughs> but we are. We're going to go out. We're going to do some educational expectations. We're going to talk about the importance of attendance. We're going to talk about the importance of test scores. We're going to talk about how to move your child forward. If the test scores aren't good, there's a report that comes out. You're going to learn from the report what we need to do to move your child ahead. And if we don't have it, there's somebody in the community that can help us out. We just got to find the right person. So that's one. We have to have an open line of communication, and we have to listen. Because my perception is different than your perception. And if we don't understand our, where we're coming from, we're not going to have the right answer. Number two highlight, we're going to provide workshops. We're going to talk about attendance. We're going to talk about what's going on in the schools. We're going to update community resources. We're going to look for things to do for our students. There's opportunities out there. We're just not looking in the right places. It's hard. I have stuff on my desk. You have stuff on your desk. But if there's no conversation, no one gets the information. There's no shame in my game. So I called my new friend, and I said, listen, I have to do summer school this year. They need me to answer three questions. How am I going to improve summer school? And the answer was, can I count on you 
to have somebody out from the organization that you work with to make sure that our kids get there safely. 15 minutes later, yes, I can do that for you. That's all you have to do is pick up the phone, have a conversation, ask the question. If you don't ask the question, you're not gonna get the answers. So we're gonna do all these things and we're gonna make sure that students have academic and career goals. Career goals are important. But again, you need to know what the steps are to get there. If you don't know the steps, you're not gonna get there. If you miss a step, you're gonna have to go back. We're willing to go back with you, but you need to learn to follow the steps, okay? All right, your turn. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Keisha Yuri. I am a citywide social worker, um, but ultimately I work for the city of Newark at the health department. I have a program um, that work with male survivors of violence, men that's been victims of violence, ages 18 to 30 but we're now working with younger um, men. I'm working at the Shawnee Baraka Center around domestic violence, sexual violence, and community violence. And we know that our young people are experiencing this more and more and more. And just last night, there was a shooting victim, um, 17, 18 year old student from Westside, right? And so we know that this is definitely a place that we don't have enough support around the safety issue, around street things that are happening, and many of us are disconnected. But for the student supports, we have a highlight number three is to invest in current and new partnerships to address social emotional learning and mental health. And so the people in our group, we had students, we had some people who were older from administration who's been in the administration for education for years, who was very disgruntled around, we've seen this happen time and time again, no one's listening, no one's listening, no one's listening, and talked about how we continue to do the same thing with the same people and the same partners. And so how do we find innovative ways and innovative partnerships with people um, that's in our community, the natural supports that we already have? And many of us don't want to talk about emotional learning and, and mental health, but many of our students are suffering tremendously from mental health, and it's so taboo and such a stigma that no one wants to address it, and they're not going to come to you to talk about it. And so we need to be comfortable enough and educated enough to address it, and now the new phenomenon is trauma-informed care, right? But we have to be savvy enough to go from being trauma-informed to trauma-engaged, because our students need to be engaged. And so we, we, we can't stay stuck there. We have to do new things, because desperate things calls for desperate measures, and that's where we are with our students. So the student supports that we need needs to be sustainable. Um, we want to make students um, feel supported, but we know that student support needs to be coordinated because our students need to have consistency and coordination and things need to be um, very, very um, in place for them. We want to make education more enjoyable. When you have student support, then students enjoy education more and so they want to come to school. They want to be engaged. Um, we want to decrease, again, the stigma around mental health and social emotional learning and that it's okay to show feelings that it's okay to express feelings. We have to make these environments okay for them to do it and safe spaces for them to do that. Um, we wanna have preventative services. We don't wanna be reactionary anymore, right? We wanna get in front of what's going on um, with our students. And so most times we have student supports that are government agencies that are in our schools and nonprofit organizations that we're working with and they're not coordinated and not working together and so we have chaos. And so we want to create some short-term and long-term um, student support. So when we're giving them their support, we have to know if it's going to be short-term or long-term before we go into it versus just giving them some services and we don't even know how long it's going to be. And so some of the services we want to talk about is behavior modification, social skills, life skills, basic needs, food, clothing, shelter, transportation, because our students don't have those things. That's support, right? when we can provide them with those things, and resources, college and career preparation, enrichment and motivation. They need to be motivated and encouraged. Um, family outreach and engagement. We know most of the things are happening at home before they get to school, so we need to be able to get in front of that and be able to outreach families and engage these families. Um, health and physical wellness. We want to have relevant community service. We know many of them need community service to be able to graduate, but it needs to be relevant for their learning experiences. Um, and mental health, safety, and spirituality, we're missing that piece. 
right? We're missing the spirituality piece. They need some support in the spiritual aspect. And that doesn't necessarily mean religious, but how can they begin to express themselves freely? Um, and we want to be able to address their learning disabilities, if they have speech issues, um, hearing or visually impaired. That, that's a huge gap in support services. And so ultimately, we want to improve the quality of life for our students, and our um, supports will make that happen. We want to change policies and make the student supports more accessible so that we don't have to go through so much red tape to get them what they need. So we, we, we want to be able to have these things. And so the last thing for our consideration is social justice and equity. Equity is a huge place. So we want workshops. The workshops should occur with parents and guardians from conception to career to promote a stronger knowledge base of educational expectations and academic pathways. We have to include the parents and we have to educate the parents and get them involved. Our partnerships with agencies and organizations should address social emotional learning and mental health and include social workers and school counselors. So social workers should be in every aspect of students' education. They should be in the homes. I'm going to go a step further beyond the schools. They're going to be in the health department, the city hall, the police department, the fire department. We need to have them in every place because social workers make things happen that nobody else can do. They figure it out when nobody else knows what to do. So we need to value them and we need to make them a part of our students' learning experience and we need to embed them in every place for student supports. All right. Thank you. Superintendent Leon, any questions, concerns, issues? Well, I wanted to show what this modeled, right? Ms. Um, um, Mary Lee Harvey. It's a um, great model. From, look at us. From Just look at us. We're great together. <laughs> It is a wonderful model. Her, we are new her, friends. Her trade is in the area of guidance. That's what, she, she was a guidance counselor years after she became a teacher in the district. Who didn't then, want to work for Mr. Leon. Yep. And then she became an administrator in the district. Who didn't um, want to work for Mr. Leon. I know. And then we have Ms. Yuri, who is a social worker by trade. Do you understand that? What we are not about is saying, this person does this, because that's what we used to do. And it was critiqued about seven, eight years ago. And the critique made sense. Everyone's doing their own little piece. Here's an example of what we're going to do. We're going to say that anything that deals with services for children cannot be in its own little compartment, but actually has to permeate through all of the work. And just in the perfect example that Ms. Harvey actually gave of, hey, we have a problem and a, a resource that the community is unaware of that is not necessarily in the South Ward, because the people in the South Ward are clear what's going on over there. But the whole idea of being able to provide services um, to our students in a real profound way, like, it's kind of almost as excited as I am, sad to say that it took the whole work on the strategic plan to actually provide us with the need that we had for this summer. So this is what it's about, that it's about saying, we are understanding that we have needs and we're not afraid to ask people for help. P.S. Um, the, you know, there were uh, two members of the community that resulted in me doing transcript audits of seniors when I was assistant superintendent of the high schools. Uh, is Dr. Santos here? Yeah, that's his responsibility now. I don't have to do that. <laughs> but making sure that I was didn't lose my touch with it. You know, so I resurrected that uh, whole procedure with the seniors. And I met with all of the school counselors in the high schools. So 14 high schools, all of the school counselors. And I just asked this question. It wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it. But I said, who are the people who supervise them? at the high schools, because we don't have anyone at the district that does that, right? And even though we had a different structure in the last three years, there still weren't people who knew what they were doing as it relates to that. So as it relates to this work at the school level, because remember, the autonomy went to the schools, um, the, 
administrators who supervise all the school counselors were in the room. And of the 14 high schools, there was only one supervisor who actually had guidance or social worker experience. So we can't have people who are leading people who aren't experts in what they're supposed to know. You know what I mean? So we can't have somebody in charge of social workers who isn't a social worker. Now you may love social work, you may think it's important, but if you didn't know what it meant to get that master's for it, you're not gonna get a job here. You understand? So I just wanna applaud both of you for the collaboration. I'm glad that y'all two became friends, um, and I appreciate all of the work that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. I am the Solution Student Conference, the one and only Dr. Lauren Wells. Hello again. I'm a little, con I have so much to say, just watching all of what just happened. Um, and I do think that Lakeisha and Mary Lee are a perfect example of what we were trying to do in the strategic planning process was bring the ecosystem into interaction with each other so that we actually began to build the change that we wanna see happen in the future. And it is just amazing to sit out there with you all and to hear all of these conveners present the work that they've been doing for the last three months. That being said, and I probably, I don't know if I should say this or not, but the, the student conference was a highlight of the work that has taken place over the last three months. Um, from an educator's point of view, it, I really don't have the words to describe the feeling that I had the entire day that I watched our students engage in ex an experience that should be their experience every single day. That's what it should be like. And I have to say that I woke up at three o'clock in the morning that morning frantic because it never, I never had a thought about it not working. I just said, this is what we need to do. These are our students. They're amazing. They're brilliant. We need to bring them into the process. And I woke up and I said, what if we aren't ready for them? Um, but it turned out that they were ready for us. And so we didn't have to worry about anything going wrong. And so just, there were 250 students, grade six to 12, in the morning they got professional development that would be delivered to any educator in any school district across the world, not just the United States, not just the Northeast Corridor, but the woman who provided PD to them, Dr. Yvette Jackson, provides professional development in Morocco, in Brazil, in Finland, to world-class educators. And so we had her spend the morning with our students, teaching them about the science of learning, teaching them about cognition and about neuroscience and about how the brain works and how the brain should be working when you're engaged in a meaningful learning process. And then we asked them to spend the afternoon taking that information and thinking about from their points of view in their feeder patterns, the ideas and the strategies that they would come up to make that their learning experience every day. And so I have some highlights here. You, we can, they're, they're on the slides. Again, building relationships is repeated with the students, as it's repeated with the parents, as it's repeated across staff, as it's repeated across the school level and the central office level. And I think it's important that it's not just relationships that focus on them as students, but that focus on our kids as human beings and people. And that really comes out when our students talk about how they want adults to understand and interact with them. Challenging learning. And I'm gonna give a concrete example. Uh, there is a, a principle that is about uh, ri uh, rigorous learning. And the students said, our teachers need to ask broader questions that make us think. That is a literal quote in our data that our students are asking for. Not yes or no questions, not true or false, right? Not A, B, C, D, but 
abstract questions that draw them into a thinking process, that the learning has to be meaningful and relevant to their lives. And that's a couple of things. It's their lives in terms of what are we going to do with what we're learning? How many times did you go to school and say, why am I learning this? I said it maybe at least once, probably 10 times throughout my career. But to understand why English matters, right? How it applies to many career paths. How if you're studying English, you're being set up to be a journalist or a news anchor or a writer or a lawyer or a magazine publisher. Those kinds of real world connections. How do I manage my life after school? So financial literacy, resumes, all of those sorts of things. Again, the culture piece comes up many, many times. Students want to know who they are. They want learning that is fact-based and historically accurate. And they want to understand and know each other. And they want to have appreciation across cultural lines, language lines, right? We can't minimize the role of language in our district with our students in our schools, and language comes up a lot. And as you heard before, students want their voices integrated into decision making, whether it's at the classroom level, whether it's at the building level, whether it's at the district level, whether it's at the level of even talking about what it is that's going on in parent conferences and the roles that students play in those things. And so what I, I, would, I want you guys to talk about the conference, because I've never seen anything like it in my life, actually. I really haven't. Uh, what I will, the last thing that I will say, Dr. Jackson showed up at, New, at NJIT. No one had ever met her before. Two hours with the students, completely engaged. What we now know is that if Dr. Jackson can show up at NJIT for two hours, and draw the brilliance that exists in our students out of them, then we have questions to ask, right? We are the ones that have to ask the questions. Because if she can do it, the question is, why isn't it happening every day, everywhere? And these young people talk to us about a little bit about your day, Michelle and Yamin. And I'm just like, it was ex extraordinarily exciting. So here's Mike. Um, so at the conference, it was really interesting to me because there were so many different grades that we were able to have a conversation with each other about the same thing because we saw the same problems throughout all of our different schools. No matter if we were in elementary school, if we were in middle school, if we were in high school, we realized that there were the same problems where we weren't connected to teachers, we weren't connected to our own cultures, and we were kind of detached from each other, not really blending in with each other and really understanding each other. So it was really interesting to see that we can make this connection even without knowing anybody in the room. Once we walked into that room and we had that conversation, we were able to connect and realize that there are so many things that can connect us. We just aren't given the resources or the time to really take that moment and connect. It's kind of like we're detached and we're forced to kind of focus on our grades and focus on the test scores and focus on learning some learning things that at times may not be interesting when really we can learn from each other because learning from each other is what really helps us to helps us to grow and helps us to understand each other better because in in this a day and age like understanding each other, understanding each other is import is as important as learning numbers or learning something else because we have to talk to each other we have to socialize with each other we can't sit and look at numbers all day because then we're not really broadening our horizons. Um, I was actually excited. I was happy to, you know, have that opportunity to be able to be looked at as a, as a young leader. You know, we wasn't in the room just as students. This was students who were leaders in the school from grade 6 to grade 12. And I said, wow, from grade 6 to grade 12. I'm really saying that. Because as a senior, I think that when we in school in class, that it's only the seniors that's the ones who are leaders in the building. But you have students who are in grade six, who are who are in grade five, grade four, grade three, who are leaders in their building. Like it starts off in classroom. You have a one classroom leader. So the teacher was like, "Who wants to be the leader today in class?" Right. So I learned that it's not just one 
upper class that's a leader, you have a whole majority of students who connect to each other. Like she said, we all had an experience and a time to connect with each other from grade six to grade 12, and that was the most powerful things ever to witness in the city of Newark. Thank you. And we're just gonna close with a quote from the Shabazz feeder pattern when they broke out to do their brainstorming about strategies. This is what came from the Shabazz feeder pattern. Our strengths are activated when we are comfortable in our area and feel safe that our knowledge is important. It gives us a place to flow and build on our understanding. When we don't get complete explanations and understanding, we can't activate our strengths. All we have is half of what we need. So the words of our students say it all. Our students have strengths, they are powerful, and they are the ones that are going to actually really inform how we do this work. Thanks. A absolutely wonderful. And um, you know, the, the notes that I received from the breakout sessions that you all were either part of or students were leading um, really speak to how we fix things. So I've shared, you know, in, in this strategy, the, the principals are the leaders. They are. They are who I'm holding responsible for making it actually happen. And they're going to do it. I feel so confident that they are and that those who can't will provide them assistance and support. And that if they really, really can't, then we'll find somebody who really, really can. Do you know what I mean? Um, the professional development that teachers are gonna receive is going to be, it's starting already, and we're gonna hear a little bit about it from Dr. Fitzhugh, magic that was occurring this week. See, we can't wait until June to have the strategic plan for the next year, which is about bringing about clarity to everything, and then start then. We're actually starting it while we're not in the strategic plan. You know what I mean? And what you just modeled for everyone who dared to be here tonight is what is the secret weapon? So the principles are the leverage. But the secret weapon, what did those t-shirts say? I am the solution, because you are. Thank you. I really, really appreciate you all. Ms. Leone, are you ready for the facilities review? At this time, Ms. Mary Bennett and Dr. Ray Lindgren. Let's give them a round of applause. Good evening. Uh, we're just waiting to see. That's a very pretty slide. It's, however, not our first slide. So. Ah, there we are. Uh, as we were getting ready for this evening, in some respects it seemed like we were a kind of a change of pace. We were going in a different direction, uh, in part perhaps maybe because some of us can't think of the full complex picture in the same way that our superintendent can wrap his head around everything. But I guess as we've sat here for this evening, we can see how we do fit as part of a piece of a puzzle. And when all of these pieces come together, we will have a beautiful picture that will be Clarity 2020. So we were asked, Ms. Bennett and I, to do a facilities review of the district. What did that mean? I mean to, um, to interrupt. Sure you but do. But there are people who are in this room who know who you both are, but there are some who don't. Yeah. So can you please let them know who you are? Because I, I think it's important. <laughs> I am Ray Lindgren, uh, a product of the Newark Public Schools graduate, proud graduate of Ann Street and Eastside High School. Also spent approximately 38 years as a teacher and administrator at various levels and in almost every high school in the district. Mary Bennett, graduate of 15th Avenue Elementary and Westside High School, class of 69. So I'm a rough rider. I came back, started my career at Barringer, Big Blue, was an English language arts teacher, moved on to my alma mater, my first administrative assignment at Westside, 
moved on to bulldog country. All right, black and gold forever. And uh, was the first female principal at Malcolm X and was there for 10 years, retired early, did some interesting things, and I was pulled back in. I was the executive director of Project Grad Newark for 12 years, and people still have that ability to pull you back in. As the superintendent said, would you come and help me with a couple of things? So that's a little bit about who we are. So now about what we were asked to do. The purpose of what we were asked to look at, to review the facilities in all of the district schools, to see what we saw and to see what the school saw in terms of their conditions, to identify deficiencies that we saw that existed and critical issues. Those two bullets are probably fairly clear. The third bullet, Determine how well the facilities support the educational programs. Perhaps not as clear, but probably the most important. For too long, we have accepted what is as what needs to be or what we will live with. We have accepted what is as what is is good enough. Good enough is not good enough for our students. Meeting the Facilities and meeting the program's missions does not mean art on a cart. It does not mean special ed in a closet. It does not mean having wonderful dance teachers who are ready to provide dynamic programs and telling them you can teach that in the classroom. Departmentalizing education starting in grade four, having content certified teachers but no science labs. Stressing the importance of literacy and the love of reading, but eliminating the position of media specialists in closing our libraries. And it does not mean creating wonderful academies and promising our high school students great things, but thinking that somehow they can achieve that through textbooks, videos, and looking at computers. So it did mean really looking at what can we do to meet our mission. And so the process that we followed, we made individual appointments with the principals to set the date. We didn't descend on our colleagues. We respected that they're responsible for their buildings, and we scheduled the meeting and usually started our day at 8 or 8.30 in the morning, and we literally walked the building, every classroom, every bathroom, every closet, the cafeteria, the gym, the boiler room, the library media center, if there is one, around the facilities of the building on the external, looking to see, does this building look like a ch place where my three grandchildren could attend? And if it doesn't work for Zara, Tim, and John, it shouldn't work for anybody's children. That's just the bottom line. We can have young people like the two we've heard from this evening in facilities that show we don't respect them. And if the building is falling down around them, if it's dirty, if it's cold, if it's too hot, if it's unkempt, if it's not properly staffed, not properly furnished, not properly lit, not properly heated, then it shouldn't be operating. What do we need to do to fix it? Because our children show up every day. They give us a chance to get it right. And so our walkthroughs of 48 schools to date is to see what do we have and what do we need to do. We collect the information. We get individual sheets from every staff member about their workspace, and we then cull that data. And as we walk, we take notes, because sometimes people write things down. And some teachers said, well, you know, I didn't know how my principal would feel if he or she saw something on the slip. I said, well, your principal's not here now. Tell me. Because if it's wrong or if it needs to be repaired, your principal wants to be a part of helping to get that done. This isn't a got you. This is what do we need to do. Each of the schools will get an individual report, and you can see that there's a list of schools that are done, and Ray and I are working our way through the reports, and these are the schools that are scheduled, and we will wrap up this month. We just wanna go back to that slide, please, Dr. Wells, just so that we can see the schools that are being scheduled. So that means every school in the district, from the top to the bottom, and every room in between. I'm talking about their reports are so thorough that it's so exciting. 
Camden, Hernandez, Horton, McKinley, Mount Vernon, Peshine, South 17th, Speedway, Spencer Miller, and 13th Avenue School. Those are the schools that are next. And we're not saying that they were the least important by any means. As Mary made a point of saying, we worked with the schools. We did prioritize the high schools because of the academies that are going in and a lot of the programs that are needed there. Once we did the high schools, we worked with the principals to make sure we could fit with their schedules. As you probably know, we're in the middle of doing all sorts of testing. You don't take principals away from the job. They said, well, do you want us to? No, we don't want you to stop being the principal. We have to work with your schedule. And at this point, we do want to thank all the principals, all of the custodians and the building managers who on average spent four to six hours in a given day walking, showing their tremendous passion for their schools, and really, when they walked with us, perhaps getting a more critical look and thinking in a new way about their school buildings. So quickly, looking at the summary of some of the findings. So as we know, we have a lot of older buildings. And unfortunately, in the last six years, our buildings have not gotten the attention that they need to. Old does not need to be decrepit. However, we have a large number of buildings, 25, 26, that are over 100 years old. Over 100 years old. Those buildings don't have elevators. So think about if you have a four-story or three-story building, everything goes up by person, being taken up, being taken down. A major issue is roofs. Water infiltration, think of where you live. Just think of your own home. If something is leaking, what happens? So water infiltration coming through the roof because of roof needs, because of pointing that's needed because gutters have not been clean is probably the largest, most destructive issue that we've seen across the 48 schools that we have walked through. And painting something that hasn't been repaired is throwing good money after bad. So where we see the most damage and see it in classrooms is where water infiltration has occurred. And that is a major issue across the district and it is also one of the biggest sticker ticket items to repair. You have masonry, pointing. Water seeks its lowest level, and where it finds a crack, it will go. So it works its way through cracks in the cement in between the bricks. So eventually you can have water not only coming through the ceiling, but coming through the sides of the building. We've all seen rain that seems to go horizontal. Well, if you have a pointing problem, it's coming in your wall. The uh, leaders and gutters have to be clean, but remember, they're on top of the building. Somebody has to be able to get up there with the equipment to do that. And then the windows, when you get the water infiltration, it starts to eat away at the plastering around the windows and you have corrosion. People have concerns about mold. You have flaking paint. And basically, you have an unseemly situation. And every day, think of your child starting his or her day in a room with stained ceiling tiles, flaky paint, and all kinds of things. And it's gone on and on and on. So the roofing problem is a major big ticket item. And we have told the superintendent that it's across the district. All five wards have water infiltration problems in their schools. And Mary talked about getting up there, being able to see the leaders, the gutters, the roofs. You see that piece of equipment, it's called a cherry picker. That's how they get up there. We have over 60 schools, over 30 of them over 100 years old. We have one cherry picker, which means maybe twice a year they can get to a given school. Once we've accomplished this, once our buildings, and we stress, First and foremost, we must get the envelopes totally closed and sealed. We've told principals who are crying about the painting, etc. don't talk about that until your building is properly sealed. You know that in your own home. You're not going to paint a wall if you're going to have another leak coming in. Once that's done, the next major issue, boilers and chillers. What we keep hearing from the schools, we can have hot, we can have cold. We have no control in between. 
Somehow we have to have a system so that you can modulate the temperature in a building. Once we've done that, and the school working very hard, and our facilities department has really put in a lot of effort. We have a number of schools who have new boilers. Unfortunately, we tend to do emergency kinds of things. So we have new boilers, but we've not addressed the over 100-year-old pipes and systems. So suddenly, we have schools that are literally like Yellowstone Park. When they turn on the heat full speed, then suddenly we have geysers all over the school destroying floors and walls. And then the next two issues. Sad to say, we still have schools where radiators are uncovered in classrooms, where we have teachers who are putting bookcases and other things near them to keep students from going near those radiators. We have got to get the radiators covered. And finally, in 1898, the Newark Public Schools did a very daring and bold thing. In 1898, the Newark Board of Education voted to allocate funds and sign a contract with a newly created company to electrify all of the schools in the city of Newark and end the era of gaslighting. In 2004, again, Newark took the forefront when the state of New Jersey started building new school buildings and we began having community forums. The state came here and said, oh, we're going to build new schools, but we can't afford to put in air conditioning, so we're not going to do that. And the North community stood up and said, oh, yes, you are. You're not going to build a new school building and not have air conditioning. Well, so we have new school buildings in Newark with air conditioning. And I'm very happy to tell you, we have several hundred-year-old school buildings in which every classroom is air conditioned. But those are few and far in between. What we have to do, what we have to do, is do a full evaluation of the capacity, the electric capacity of every building so that we know we have the capacity to meet the needs both of technology, as it is ever increasing, and for air conditioning. And as we meet that, as we get in sufficient capacity, we then need to move forward to put in air conditioning in every classroom to provide the year-round programs that are a critical part of Clarity 2020. Because of the heating imbalance in classrooms, you'll find a room with a temperature of 100, and it'll be December, and the air conditioner will be on to try to get some balance. That's because we have no zone control in the older buildings. We also have, and we talked about the uh, ongoing building conditions, so you see the stained ceiling tile, that would be water infiltration. Here you have, our buildings either have painted walls or tiled walls. The buildings that opened before 1950, most of them have painted walls completely. You go into the bathrooms, you're going to find tiles. We have to replace tiles, but guess what? That's a yellow wall, you want yellow tiles. Go back, when they fix it, you could have pink tiles. The aesthetic should not be forgotten and we need to stock up with what we need. A, today I was at a building, South 17th Street, the electrician showed up, the principal did the happy dance, the head custodian did the happy dance because the electrician was there repairing ballast because you had rooms where three, four, five, six lights were out. And we were very, very pleased he finally got there. Guess what? He only had a few ballasts, so he said, I'll use right, I'll put in every one that I have, but I know I'm gonna run out and they don't have any more at the shop. What is that? We've got to have something as simple as ballast on hand so children are not sitting in classrooms with five or six lights out. We need to stock up with what we need so when we go out to make a repair, we have what is necessary to make a repair and a repair that's aesthetically pleasing. I don't wanna see pink tiles in a yellow bathroom. Barringer High School, all of their hallways are not painted, they're tiled. But guess what? They're blue tiles, they're about five or six shades of blue tiles now. 
we need to stock up on what we know we're going to need to maintain our buildings. Maybe it's because as adults, as administrators, teachers, etc., we spend most of our time in classrooms. Maybe it's because as adults we tend not to spend a lot of time in student bathrooms. But the reality is our student bathrooms are in serious, serious shape. In far too many schools, we found toilets that are not working. We found toilets that are missing. In one school recently I went in, they had disconnected a toilet, but it was still sitting as a disconnected toilet in the stall. There are sinks that are missing. There are sinks that have no hot water or cold water. There needs to be a full evaluation of all student bathrooms to make sure that the students have what they need. That's obviously just common courtesy and making them feel like human beings. So, and again, it may be that we have, it's not, we don't see it, it's not the classroom, but it is an important part of our school and we definitely need to address it look at it systemically. In all of these things, we need to be systemic. We need to develop a program, a process, and a schedule to address these issues. Kitchens and cafeterias, we have cooking kitchens and warming kitchens. So when we go in, the first thing I do is look for whomever is in charge and say, are you a cooking kitchen or a warming kitchen? And I have to tell you, the commercials about the cafeteria ladies is just so on point. Those folks are so committed to trying to serve the best that they can, using what they have, and trying to make it as appetizing as possible. With cooking kitchens, is the equipment working? Is the chiller working to keep the milk properly cold at the right temperature? Because they've all been trained in food safety, so they know warm food, hot food has to be kept at a certain temperature, Cold things, milk and the like, have to be kept at a certain temperature. And so we need to make sure that the equipment that's in the cafeterias, whether it's a cooking kitchen or a warming kitchen, is working. And if it's not working, it should not sit there two years before it's replaced. But the cafeteria ladies, I have to tell you, are on point. They are serious with their hair nets, and they're doing the best they can. They are really really adamant about taking care of little people, taking care of big people. They know the kids' allergies. They know them by name. They're a marvel to watch. They need to have what they should have. They shouldn't have to always make do. And kids should be able to have warm food. Just because you're not a cooking kitchen, you should not always be eating a cold meal. And administrators and school staff also have to be commended for managing to feed maybe a thousand or more students in a cafeteria space that may feed, uh, seat less than 200 and managing to get that done in a very organized manner. Finally, and again, as the superintendent said, we are com submitting complete reports on all of these schools with much more detail. But the last area we wanted to just highlight, again, is one we mentioned earlier, and that's the area of technology because it is so very, very important. And this is both a good news, bad news kind of a story. The good news is, as we visited schools, it was incredibly encouraging to see the tremendous amount of technology that is being made in our schools and is being used. In vast majority of classes, we saw students using, actively involved with technology. We saw station learning. We saw differentiated learning, where students really are actively engaged. At the same time, and this was somewhat of a surprise to us, after the HVAC and the temperature, the next biggest area of concern and frustration on the part of the staff was with technology. Smart boards that do not fully work. Taking the time because we do not have necessarily the resources in the district to get to them to provide the support. Keeping it upgraded. We are pleased to say that most schools indicate they are very close to reaching the one-to-one -one goal the district has of having either a Chromebook or some sort of handheld device for every student. But many of them are getting old and don't work. We remind you, the state of New Jersey does not qualify computers, laptops, etc., as equipment. By state standards, they are consumable supplies 
because they are not expected to last more than five years. And when you put them through the use that our students are giving them, they won't. It is great to have technology, but we must make sure it is upgraded, supported, and replaced. There must be, on general, a budget that says 25% of all technology gets replaced every year so that we continue to see this. Technology is the present and most definitely the future. It's great to see that our students are ready to use it. Now we have to make sure we continue to make it proper in their hands. And so as we come to wrap up our uh, facility reviews, and we will do so, our goal is to finish all the physical plant walkthroughs and then provide a written report for each and every building given all the categories we've identified. The one thing we ask the principals is, does your building help you meet your needs? What programs are you currently offering? What would you like to offer? And what needs to be done in the building to help you to get there? And sometimes they said, you know, nobody really asks us that. We kind of learn how to make do. I think we need to move beyond just making do. And I think we have to keep in mind that the buildings are serviceable, but they have to be kept presentable, safe, and utilitarian. Our buildings have to be painted. The district has got to develop some systems, systems, not emergency response, but systems for how do you maintain the building? How do you paint? People should expect their buildings to be cycled through and painted every four or five years. And guess what? They should leave some touch-up paint there with them because they know nobody's coming back to repaint for several years. But in the meantime, they could do some touch-up painting. The right color paint that was used. So systems, repairs. You put things in school dude, which is, it just sounds funny. It's called school dude, school dude, anyhow, but anyhow. Putting something in school dude doesn't mean you're going to get due to your building and get it done in a timely manner. Right. So what's in school dude is a request for service. That needs to turn into a tradesperson coming out. Many jobs require multiple tradespersons. If you have a problem in the bathroom, the plumber may come in and make a hole in the wall and fix the pipe. The plumber's not going to fix the hole in the wall. The masonry person has to come. And it should not be considered done until the head custodian signs off, meaning everybody who needed to touch the job completed their part and it's left in a presentable manner. Old does not have to be decrepit, and we just have to begin to work on some systems for facility maintenance and upgrade that provide an environment for our young people to be in and that they can fully develop and look at the building and know people care about us being here because they keep the building clean, they keep it safe, and they continue to work to make the programs we need come into our building to help us. Thank you. All right. I want to take this opportunity to thank um, both of you. I just want to put a couple things into perspective for people who may not be aware of this. We did not just get here. This, this, this did not start on July 1. Um, and um, to put it into further perspective, every school district in New Jersey is required to uh, write a five-year long-range facilities plan. Mm -hmm. It's required in code. Um, in 2014 was when this district wrote its plan. That would give it its five-year lifespan, which means this June 2019 is when it comes to an end. I wouldn't expect to have a school district that has a problem with warmers and freezers and toilets that have been sitting on bathroom floors. That didn't happen this year. Um, these walls that appear as though people don't care about the children. You know, students were worrying about AC in September when ACs have been in boxes for about a year and a half. Um, so what my strategy was this. Even though I trust people, you know, verify. One, verify. So what I did was get two people, two babies of the school district, two children of the city, uh, who know the city, who know 
the school's far better than a whole lot of other people. Two people who not only I care about, just personally, I love both of you, but the whole idea that I know that you're gonna give me a report that says this is what it is, not what I wanted it to be. It's not make-believe, it's not sugar-coated, it's open, it's honest, it's clear, it's precise, that I know that when I walk particular schools, and you are saying, in this room, there's this problem. When I go see it, I will see it as well. So I wanted to not only you know, put that into perspective, but just in case if anybody was wondering, well, why didn't anyone in the district do it? I don't know. Why haven't they done it in the last five years? My whole point is that there's a lot of work that needs to occur. The reason why I wanted this presentation here tonight is because, first of all, I'm getting all of these reports from you all and wanted to put it into perspective so that both of you who are instructional people, you know how to improve teaching and learning. That if the building is not designed to address those needs, right, we can still have good instruction in the classroom and provide all of these as excuses, but ultimately the, the climate in that school is impacted in a real, real profound way. We have to do both. And so while uh, Dr. Fitzy will talk about what we're doing academically, this whole conversation about what the infrastructure looks like helps us create the path to get where we're actually going. And you know, although I think highly of both of you, um, this work was extremely important work, and um, I just uh, feel honored that you all were called to the task and that you delivered exceeding the expectations. Absolutely. Thank you both. Our last report for the evening, excuse me, is going to be a district academic update from Dr. Fitzhugh. Well, while well, Dr. Fitzhugh gets this, um, gets there and is um, ready to um, share some really important information, the Q and A portion of the meeting is very um, is different from our board meetings in that it's not a three minute conversation from anybody. But if there is anything that you heard. Uh, during the course of the couple of hours that we've been in here that you want to highlight that there will be an opportunity for you to do that. Um, that if in fact there's something that you think of all of the great people that have been working on this, that something was left out, I would also want you to highlight that because we don't have uh, or the strategic plan that will then get announced in June. Um, that one will consist of the one year component. Uh, a lot that you've heard are things that in order for us to actually accomplish them, it's gonna take some time. Um, so part of my responsibility is to manage the expectations of the work. Um, and those of you who are here um, may think that one thing is more important than another, and in some instances you may be very uh, correct, but the sequencing of how we actually begin to make the reparations becomes really, really important. And so part of tonight was to see the whole picture, as much of the whole picture as possible, so that you can actually see how beautiful it is going to look. Dr. Fitzhugh. Good evening, everyone. We're good? Are we really good? I just want you to know that the um, curriculum instruction is the nucleus of the work. We talked about the facilities updates, which impacts the innovative work that we have to do within the confines of our school building. So Superintendent Leon, I have to tell you, I have to tell you something really important, okay? The textbook adoptions were so critical these last three days. When I tell you from the presentations that all of our mathematics teachers um, took part in, but additionally the ELA teachers beginning that work in the K through eight sector today and tomorrow beginning K through 12, I tell you Superintendent Leon, the questions that they asked the rubrics that they filled out. Again, asking the presenters to go deeper because they understood and know our children. That's what I think is the most critical for those persons that are at the table. So before, and after mentioned, I talked about the importance of having teachers at the table when we deal with curriculum um, adoption pieces. Our teachers are at the table across all school leadership teams. I'm gonna say that again. We have teachers not relegated to one leadership team, we have teachers relegated to all school leadership teams. We should have something to say about that, don't you think? All right. <laughs> so 
So just very quickly, um, once we look at some of the... But I think it's just important for everyone to understand that the way that our school system has been reorganized is that there are three elementary uh, leadership teams and then one high school leadership team. That's how our structure. And the three elementary leadership teams are geographically organize themselves. Can you give everyone, so teachers from all of those teams mm -hmm. um, were called to assist in this textbook adoption. So um, Monday and yesterday was math. mathematics. Can you get, tell everybody about how many people we're talking about. So Monday and Tuesday were mathematics. On Monday and Tuesday, we had about 80 staff persons, administrators and teachers. Today was K through eight ELA. We had about 35 staff persons teachers and administrators. Tomorrow we'll wrap up ELA. We're gonna have a K through 12 continuum. We're gonna really delve more into the um, curricula resources that are evident from the first um, group of staff persons that looked at all of these um, proposals that came through the, P the PQS, right? And we had to really look at them and see if they were in the best interest of our students holistically throughout our district. So we put out a proposal saying, we're looking for a new textbook in mathematics and literacy, uh, and we put that out to the country, because we want the best to show up. Right now, the materials that we are using with our students yielded last school year, so in June of 2018, sorry, yes, 2018, the test results in literacy for the elementary schools was a little bit above 30% passing. That means that more than 60 plus percent failed. And in mathematics, hovering around 27% passing in the elementary schools, with 15% at the high schools, with every single one of our comprehensive high schools below 7%. That means that 93% of the students in comprehensive high schools did not pass the state math test. Now you can say that you have a problem with the state math test. I have a problem with 93% of the students not passing it. Our students can pass anything that we provide, of, of, that we put in front of them. Regardless of what are any biases that people will make an argument, our students are from Newark and they can excel at very, very high levels. I know that they can. And so if we give them shoddy materials that are not gonna result in student achievement, that's what we have. So we're taking the math curriculum. I already did the high school in the summer. We didn't use the horrible, atrocious strategy that we've been using that has yielded no one passing math. So we went away with that. So this whole year, we had to study it. Are we doing the right thing? And we've concluded that we're not. So the students this year, used in literacy a curriculum that was not worthy of their time. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna not use it anymore. The teachers are going to help us select the books that are gonna be before our kids, that are culturally sensitive to them, that are going to be mindful of the different types of learners that we have in our school. And that just started this week. Um, and you know, with your leadership and uh, members of um, both the math team and the literacy team, I know that the people that were convened are just really on point. So we took some of our very best teaching staff members to do the work that you're talking about right now. So Superintendent Leone, you've always, you've coined the phrase, we're gonna get it right. And if those resources that we are viewing are not the right fit, then we're gonna go back out and we're gonna do another PQS. We're gonna go back out and make sure we find the right materials for our students. But in case they are the right materials, the mathematics and ELA teams will present to the Programs and Instruction Subcommittee of the Board of Education on Tuesday, May 14th, 2019, beginning at 5.30 p.m. And finally, on May 21st, 2019, those same teams alongside myself will present to the full board at the business meeting because the public needs to know what we're doing. The full board needs to know what we're doing. So um, as a part of the work in terms of looking at some of our subgroups that need um, support and assistance, we, did a, we conducted a needs assessment in the area of bilingual education. So very quickly, 
Superintendent Leon, I just want you to look um, at the three given indicators that are present on the screen. We want to know who is achieving and growing. We want to know what conclusions we can make about the achievement and growth. We have to look at those data points, right? Do we agree with that? And what services led to the achievement and growth based on sound theory? We don't want to look at something that's just saying, you know what, it worked. We want to know what worked, why it worked, and how we're going to implement it throughout the city. The key findings of the ELO audit, and I have to emphasize that though there was growth, there was minimal growth. We have work to do. Results indicated strong evidence that ELLs grew on an average with the ELA scores for grades 4 through 8 and 11. There wasn't, um, again, also almost all the students' average growth amounts across grades were positive except grade 9. So leaving the middle school and going to the high school sector. There's work that we have to do in the middle school sector. Superintendent Leon, instruction, we have stuff to do. This needs assessment taught us that there has to be a commitment to do the work through a varying um, of different uh, modalities. Looking at data management, looking at the resource allocation, and what does those critical attributes tell us? We have to look at the identification and screening and exiting of our ELLs. We have to remove some of these barriers. We can't have any excuses. Do we agree with that? We have no excuses, right? We have to put in front the areas that are difficult, and we have to remediate them. Is there an area with, um, are there areas of concern with enrollment, communication, infrastructure? My partners just talked about the non-innovative um, buildings that we have across the city. We have to get them innovative because we need our ELLs, our special needs population, our general education population students to grow pedagogically. Professional development, we have to make sure we have the best. It has to be individualized. It can be the one-size-fits-all philosophy. Staffing, Superintendent Leon always makes the, the um, discussion in our executive meetings, where do our vacancies lie? We have to make sure that we're staffing and we're doing a good job with staffing those vacancies. Capacity building, instructional planning, what does that look like in our buildings? We have to make sure that we're having those key conversations at the school sectors, but again, our central office administrators must be present at those conversations to know vertically and horizontally what needs to be done. Data analysis and using data. I can't just give everybody the data. I need people to extrapolate it, right? Those that are in front of children need to know their students better than I know their students. So if I go to a classroom and I ask them for the students who are their top tier, I need to know why and again, what skills they are deemed to be top tier and where are the areas of growth that are needed. Do we agree with that? So what I think is very important through the ELL conversation, but also through our special needs conversation, our general education conversation, we need to have quality school reviews. We have Cambridge education in our buildings. What does that mean? We have 30 schools that have already been seen by Cambridge associates. We had surveys done. We had students tell their truth. We had parents tell their truth. We had principals. We had everybody telling the truth. Ms. Leon, we want them to tell the truth, don't we? It's all in the name of transparency. Factors that limit student learning with an emphasis on underperforming subgroups and also corresponding critical resource inequities. And also factors that support and enhance student learning. What does that look like across the city within all of our SLTs? So I want to take you, go ahead. I'm sorry, Superintendent. No, um, one of the things that I just wanted to point out with these uh, quality school reviews that Cambridge did for us, um, you know, we've done surveys before, but the support that we received from the North Teachers Union and both with uh, CASAS of the leaders of our schools was absolutely incredible. We have never had the thousands of, of instructional staff that we have complete these surveys like this. I'm talking about over 3,000 employees wound up filling out these surveys. And, and I mean, I don't know why, but they just took advantage of the fact that we kind of said to them, we 
don't know who you are and we want you to be honest about what you think the needs are. This is not about the building or how it, the lights are a problem. We were talking about really the academic programming, the culture in their schools and what I dared them to do whenever I fill out a survey, whether I was a kid or a teacher or an administrator, I always sign my name because I want you to know what I was saying. And so I shared with the staff, I want you to do that. If you're, don't be afraid to do that because you might actually write something that's true and we might need to ask you for some clarifications to help us on making it better. So thousands of employees. Then we asked parents, hey, we need your input. The largest number of parents that have ever responded, we've had responses in the past, but we've never had thousands of parents responding. And then the last thing, once again, we targeted students from a certain grade in the elementary school, below grade six, all the way through high school. And we had about 17, 18,000 students complete surveys. We've never in the history of this school district ever had that. And you know, it's um, creating an analysis for us that will help guide us in the work. That's gonna be the trick, that people are gonna see that they wrote something was wrong and then we actually did something about it. Superintendent Leon, I just wanna um, show you some of the highlights from the first 30 schools of the Cambridge Reviews. Schools and teachers managed student behavior well. They walked these classrooms, they walked the hallways, they were in the cafeteria, they were there during arrival and dismissal. We were able to see that there were improvements across the city. Students are rewarded for good behavior and consequences are consistent. The most important piece is that the out of school suspensions at our high school levels across the city have decreased. That is critical and that should be celebrated. So I wanna give that a big round of applause. Schools implement effective measures to promote good attendance and reduce truancy and tardiness. From the Give Me Five campaign from the beginning of the school year to our guidance counselors having those key conversations with our students, our kids want to come to school. They want to be there on the continuum. Schools have forged collaborative partnerships with the community. We have dual enrollment throughout the city with NGIT, Essex County College, Rutgers University. So again, we're doing the right thing in terms of giving students exposure to higher education, but also vocational education. School culture is positive, professional, and collegial in most of our schools, of the 30 schools that we've already visited. So now I'm gonna bring you to the things that limit student learning, because when there are things that are positive, there's some things we have to work on. Do we agree with that? So teachers need more support to use data to plan instruction that meets the needs of all students. This is the focal point of POCs. They should be instructionally stimulating, they should have all their data points, and that's how you create your lesson plans on a continuum. Schools administer, administer multiple assessments over the course of the school year, but not all assessments are well aligned to the standards. Well, what about, them not, what about not using the results from the, the assessments to impact teaching and learning? That is critical. The quality of teacher questioning is mostly low level. Many questions being asked in classrooms were what questions establishing the recall from students. We want to see levels three and four on Webb's depth of knowledge. We want to be on the higher tiers of Bloom's taxonomy. We have to expose our students to those given entities. It's okay to give them some recall questions to begin the lesson, but we're going to expose them to those higher order question and discussion techniques. They have to compete with their peers. Not all school leaders closely monitor planning and delivery of lessons, provide frequent and actionable feedback on instruction. This is a must. The leverage point that Superintendent Leon has given us are our principals. We have to make sure our principals are ensuring that the um, planning is monitored, and delivery of instruction is evident across the continuum. A data point that is critical is what? Doing those walkthroughs and having those on, those real-time conversations with our teaching staff. They need to know what they're doing, things that are good, and things that need areas of improvement. Staff recruitment and retention is a challenge. 
We want to make sure we want teachers to stay here. We also want to recruit the best. Teachers are not sharing success criteria for lessons that um, they're doing. Again, students can tell you what the tasks they're doing, but they're, they cannot tell you in terms of how they're going to achieve the objective. That's problematic. They need to know what the goal is of the objective and how they're going to master it. Do we agree with that? Do we agree with that? Yes. Recommendations for the first 30 schools. Leaders should consistently provide feedback on lesson plans. As a principal, I read every word of those lesson plans. As a vice principal, I did the same thing. Right, Ms. Jones? All right. And I wrote a book, and I'm going to sit with you and make sure it's right. They may not like it, but that's going to be how I develop my teachers. I can't just write it. I have to lead them, right? Teachers should challenge um, students thinking with larger numbers of higher order questions. We're not doing only lower lo level questioning techniques. We're doing higher order. We're going to expose our students to higher order questioning and discussion techniques. And lastly, Superintendent Leon, we're going to make sure that we um, look at the measures to track student success. We have to know what those given indicators are, and we're going to push our teachers to be able to tell those critical indicators through professional learning development um, sessions within our school sites, but also in front of all of our administrators and their teacher peers through PD um, on a continuum. Thank you. Yep. And so that the folks understand, so the, the good people at Cambridge you know, came uh, to the school district many years ago and uh, were definitely um, utilizing their services. Uh, again, um, uh, actually Superintendent Surf had uh, contracted out um, with them and uh, we were actually able to seize that contract and redirect them in the way that we've done uh, here. Um, so we're excited about that. That's an example of how we pass the baton on, right? We, we're supposed to move the work in the same um, direction. And I want to just thank um, Dr. Fitzhugh and um, you know the work that he is doing and all of the members of the academic portion of the organization um, you know, for their assistance, uh, especially during these very, very important days. This week is critical towards the big change that will actually uh, happen on, from an academic standpoint in our respective classrooms. Then what happens once the adoption is, once the recommendation is before me, and then I present it to the board um, it, for approval, their voting for it will then result in um, the plan to actually implement it. Um, and then if what the team presents to me isn't worthy of going before the board, then that May deadline goes away, we go back to the table, because we can't afford to provide students with something that is not going to help them academically. We already did that, and we see how well that didn't do for us. So we will make sure that we go to the board. We will go to the board and the board members that are here and I'm sharing it with them, and I know that they will share it with their colleagues, that when we come to them with something, is because we have hundreds of teachers who have said, this is the right thing to do, so that they can vote with confidence uh, on that. So that portion of the uh, presentation, let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Wells, Dr. Fitzhugh, I mean, everybody, Anyone who's still here in the room, I just want to thank you to our Board of Education uh, members, to my highly skilled professional who, I'm calling her mine because she's mine, and um, let me tell you, she uh, has uh, played a very critical role um, with us uh, throughout, you know, she's ours, but she's hired by the state, and I have to tell you that she has been tough on us because she knows that what our babies need, because she provided it as a teacher and principal in this school district, and definitely led the way as the deputy superintendent when she was in that role. And she's just been so such an important and critical partner. Members of the executive staff that are still here. So we have our assistant superintendents, those who presented. I have my school business administrator, Valerie Wilson. I have uh, ASUPS in the back. I have General Counsel Brenda Liss. I have my Communications Director Tracy Mumford. 
uh, hold on, Val. Hold on. You ain't getting no promotion. You stay at your school. I saw that our chief of staff, the chief of staff, um, uh, was recognized. Miss Wilhelmina Holder. I'm recognizing her. Um, <laughs> she, she, title extraordinaire. Um, and so, if I miss anybody, all of the staff members that are obviously here. I see all my community engagement specialists. No matter what problems are put before this administration, we are smart enough to work through it. So just know that, that part of it. Some of my students, it's late, y'all. We will take this opportunity um, to have anyone who would like to make a comment. It's either an affirmation, so the rules are kind of strict. It's an affirmation of any portion of what you heard, right? You're like, oh, this works, this is good, I think that's gonna work, I think that's gonna work. So we want the affirmation part of it. We left something out. All these people working for three months, you are like, well, you know, you should have thought of this. We wanna hear that. If you think we got something wrong, you know, and you wanna like play us out about it, that's why there's a microphone up there, all right? So we would like to, uh, the time limits are interesting. So you got like about a minute, you got 90 seconds. It's not a board meeting, so you don't have three minutes. If you have an ADA issue, you know, we'll deal with the paperwork about the lawsuit later. But right now, everybody has 90 <laughs> seconds for the presentation. The microphone is there. Go, my love, you will go first. The incredible doctor extraordinaire. You can get, you can start forming a line over there for me. Uh, Ars High School will then do that. And then uh, we appreciate all of you who are uh, coming to the microphone. If you just let us know who you are, just in case um, we need to do a follow-up, we'd appreciate that. Okay, just really quick, because everyone wants to go home. Uh, I'm Lyndon McDonald Carter. I'm a professor. I'm director of paralegal studies at Essex County College. I'm also a professor of criminal justice and um, political science. Um, I noticed one thing, and I was glad to hear this from the students, and I think I just want to clarify. I think they were saying that they want to learn how to learn. And when one learns how to learn, it doesn't matter what area they're in because they know how to, to study and educate themselves. That was one thing, and I th you know, they seem to be looking for classroom opportunities, provide them with discovery, exploration, and problem solving, which they do outside the school system, I'm sure, all the time. So I just wanted to, I was happy to hear that from the students, that they want to learn how to learn. And I thought that was most important. The other part, the last piece um, that the, the deputy superintendent, did I get your title? Okay. Um, the last piece was in terms of the individuals who are, who are authors from this area of Newark and New Jersey, that those books be included in the curriculum. And the last thing is that um, a lot of these things have to do with a lot of employment opportunities for, that are available, should be available for people who live in the city of Newark, uh, since we, you know, taxpayers kind of contribute to that. So I'd like to see some of those opportunities uh, for contracts and things to come out of the city. And the last thing is um, there's some small bookstores that are interested in working with the Newark Public Schools. One here right in Newark on Broad Street, source of knowledge, they're really looking forward to working with you guys. So thank you. Just uh, uh, Dr. Uh, McDonald Carter, just make, I know we have your information, just make sure that Dr. Fitzhugh has it so we could just do a couple of follow-ups, okay? If you don't mind, thank you. Oh, I'm not waiting till 11 o'clock, Linda. Okay, you skipped, you, you moved past a whole bunch of people. All right, go ahead. Please state your name for the record. Wilhelmina Holder, hi. And I'm definitely on board with the initiative, um, Clarity 2020. Um, I just wanted to stress the importance of getting the student engaged earlier. Um, Dr. Wells was absolutely correct. I like to see the students engaged as early as the fourth grade in terms of active, I mean really, really active student council. I've seen that in other districts where children in, as young as the fourth grade were able to articulate what their needs and desires were and they were really running their schools and I like that kind of development and leadership so when they get into high school, when I see them doing SAT prep, they won't have to go, oh, I think I'm going to this college, I think I want to do this, because by then they're focused and they're more determined and they've had exposure, because exposure is 110% of the game. And um, we haven't done that very well in the past, 
but I believe we will be doing this under Superintendent Roger Leon because I've seen his work from years and years ago. And the other issue is, would you please monitor closely the attendance of the faculty, the educators? Because the one thing I noticed, if we're going to um, hold the students accountable, we've got to hold our folks accountable. Um, I've been in schools and I've seen some of the numbers. One of the principals actually hid the board from me when I said, what, 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 what is that? You know, and uh, the number of students, the number of teachers that were absent for whatever reason. Um, I think we need to have that close alignment so that the children have a real opportunity to succeed um, because that has been a problem historically. And last but not least, the math issue just dropped my heart. 97% of the students cannot pass ESL math or whatever it's called, NJSL or PARC or whatever. It's all one and the same, the standardized test. That is a crime because our children are brilliant, they're geniuses, and they can do math. And I think historically some of the issues I faced as a mother and now facing as a grandmother with one of my own children who's having difficulties in math is because they don't have a consistent math instructor. You have math teachers in and math teachers out. And um, they don't do looping when I think they should, third and, third and fourth grade looping, fifth and sixth grade looping, seventh and eighth grade looping. So when they get to high school, they already have taken algebra one. They're able to take physics so that they can get those dual degrees that they should get, um, dual enrollment degrees and opportunities that they should get, whether they go to college or not. And lastly, uh, Mr. Superintendent, I wish that we can, you can assure that I never have to hear what I heard today, that not all children are college material. Thank you. Yeah, so who has said that though? Go back. You need more, you need more. I have to say, it was not necessarily an NPS person, but it was an administrator, and there are those people who I watch, sometimes you gotta step back and watch, and they act that because they believe that because they limit opportunities. When you talk about taking kids to college tours and fairs, and they say, we don't want to do that. Not all kids are going to college. So why do you want to do that? It's not about the fact that they're college bound. It's about that exposure. That's what's important to me because that made a difference in my life, the life of my children, the life of my grandchildren, the life of all the children in the neighborhood who succeeded. So, we really have to work on our language. Thank right, you. Right, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to clarify. As it relates to the student achievement data that I was talking about, we, we know that the average at the high schools was 15%, which makes it 85% didn't pass. When I was talking about 93%, I was talking about at the, at the comprehensive high schools. The highest passing score on average of the school was 7% at one of the comprehensive, with the lowest being 0.8. That's 0 0.8. And let me tell you, like, um, they know how to add, okay? <laughs> they know how to add, and we're going to uh, work with everyone to make sure that there's evidence that our students know math. Hi, Superintendent Leo. My name is Rihanna Lewis, and this is my husband, Jermaine Lewis, Lewis. graduates of NJIT and Rutgers Newark. Um, so uh, we were invited here by our angel, Miss Noreen, um, to talk about our experience uh, with enrolling our daughter in school. Um, Hello, one second. Yes. Your daughter's name, Olivia? Yes. Okay, good. I want you to tell this story. Okay. So um, we decided to move back to the city that we fell in love in all those years ago, buy property, start a business. And uh, I'm not going to cry because it's... Um, so in September, when we closed on our house, we went to enroll my daughter in school. Well, I understood that we were past the enrollment period and there was no really, you know, she was not going to get into a school in our neighborhood or one that was performing at least decently. So we went to the Newark Enroll Center and um, pretty much we got the, the people there laughed in my face when I said, oh, you know, I'd like for my daughter to attend First Avenue School or Park School or Branch Brook or whatever, you know, just something in our neighborhood. They pretty much said, huh, that's fat chance. Everybody wants their kid to go there. So um, fine, we, we, we sucked it up and we put her in a Catholic school for a year, you know, scrimped and saved, put her in a Catholic school. 
So put her in a Catholic school, went through the Newark enrollment process, and this year, when we got our letter back, she got matched with no schools, like zero. Like they said, you were not matched with any schools. So you can only imagine, as a taxpayer and as someone who, you know, as people that love the city of Newark so much, we came to invest in it and raise our daughter here. Um, it was very disheartening. So good thing I know a lot of um, uh, women that are, excuse my language, badasses, okay, and stood behind me, including a Dorian um, and Miss Dawn, that was part of the school board. She actually walked me into the Newark and Rose uh, Center this year, um, and still they told me that there was no seats for my daughter at any of the schools on my list. Um, so. I left there and said a couple of words to myself that were, you know, not very nice. Um, and vowed, to, told my husband that we will be moving out of the city of Newark because obviously they don't want us here, you know, or the people, the school, I don't know who, don't want, they don't want us here. We were told at the Newark and Rose Center that because my daughter went to a private school last year, she is, was, it, the algorithm puts her at the bottom of the list. So, that means that there is no, um, you know, school students that have already been in the Newark public school system get first priority over over someone that comes in from not in the Newark public school system, and so that was extremely disheartening. Um, so you know, I don't back down, um, and I fight. I will fight till the end for my daughter. So I contacted everyone possible. Contact, contacted all these amazing women that I knew from um, a, a very, very, one of my best friends. And um, we, in the end, got connected with um, Miss Noreen, and she helped us because when we went to Newark uh, Enrollment Center, again, we were scoffed at um, and treated actually very poorly. Uh, we walked in with Ms. Dawn, who's an associate chair, or I did, walked in with Ms. Dawn, who's the associate chair, um, and she's not here anymore, but that really meant nothing. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can stay in this city and that my baby is now in a school, thanks to Miss Noreen, um, in our neighborhood. Um, and I'm hoping that we can fix this system because it doesn't, all my friends that I graduated with at NGINT at Rutgers, you know, I'm like, Newark is the hot spot. Like, come on, like, we love Newark, let's do it. We all, you know, spent a number of years here, but I can't convince them because of stories like this. They're like, well, psh, I'm not doing this. You know, like, why would I come here when my baby can't go to school? So I just wanted to hope that that's something that uh, can be looked into. I don't know if there's a glitch in the algorithm or what's going on with that, but it's not, it's not okay. Oh yeah, oh, yeah it's a glitch, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, so, one of the things when this was introduced into the district a number of years ago um, that um, was instituted by uh, Superintendent Anderson was an appeal process. And, um, you know, she had me represent her on the appeal process. So that was really exciting because it was something that was new and different to the students and their families here. And meaning the whole concept of what was called one Newark, now Newark and Rolls. Um, and um, there were a lot of things that were confusing then. Mm -hmm. And so over years, the appeal process was removed. And this is a perfect example as to why, in the process, there just needs to be yet a review that's not done by an algorithm, mm -hmm. um, that is actually done by human beings that um, can analyze what the situation is, assess if something went wrong, and address it. So um, we've been studying under this administration this system as it exists, mm -hmm. um, and we're extremely excited about everything that we've learned about it, because it explains a lot of things that have confused people who have come to the microphone at board meetings for the last couple of years. So. There was a team that dedicated itself towards uh, making sure that it was followed as it was intended, and you experience what was intended. So the appeal corrects it, 
And so, you know, um, although I've never met either of you as you know, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I obviously knew Olivia mm -hmm. already. <laughs> um, so we're gonna do right by all of the Olivias in this city. Because what we actually need to help make the city better is to um, improve our high schools. That's how we turn and flip a city, through its high schools. I can't have you at an elementary school right now and then decide not to go to any of the high schools in Newark because you don't think she's gonna be educated properly. So I, right. in front of everyone that's right. here, commit to you with the story that you've taken you know, out of your time this evening to share, at first at the start, emotional. I already knew where she was going and I have to say to you that um, while well, my son came into my life kind of weird, he was already 10 years old and then he became mine at mm -hmm. 15, um, that she's at a school where I would have wanted him to go to. They're gonna take care of your little baby. But I want you to also understand that that didn't happen because you um, spoke to anyone because that's also what the system was supposed to prevent. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to prevent access because you, you knew someone. Mm -hmm. The reason why your baby's there, even though people, mm -hmm. trust me, I saw them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like, oh, how can we do this? I said, we do this through an appeal process. And I have to share that because we did it with Olivia, we've done it with a number of other students as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And they've won their appeals because the strategy of the system was to have the babies attending the school that their parents chose. And you chose one that I govern over. So thank you. Yeah, they um, gave me a list of schools that were not any that I chose. And they were like, well, I mean, actually the woman, when, when she suggested one was like, so you're not going to match her with any of the schools? And I said, um, no. <laughs> You gave me this booklet that gave me all these statistics and I'm an educated person and I read this book and no, these options that are left are not, are not options that I would like my daughter to go to. And she was like, okay, and then that was it. <laughs> I walked out in tears because I'm not a crier, okay? But th when it comes to my daughter, I'm a crier because she is everything. So in any case, thank you so much for listening to us and we appreciate your time. Bradley, you're on the line. So Bradley, go on me, I will be the last person, go. Okay, so um, good evening, my name is David Doughty, I'm Junior 2020 President at Arts High School. Um, so first off, I would like to give acclimates first to this administration, and of course, the lead visionary of many visionaries, Superintendent Leon. So I've been here in North all my life, born and raised here. I went to Parkside uh, Preschool over on Park Avenue, went to First Avenue School from K through six, and now I'm at Arts High School from seventh grade all the way to my current year. So um, in this city, in the North Public Schools, in the North Board of Education, in this city, um, for the first time in all my years of being here in the education system, I finally see a vision and a sense of purpose for the students in this system. And it's something that we haven't been given for a long time that's been way overdue. So my question is now, so as someone who is a currently a junior and aspiring also running for this year's Student Representative Board of Education spot, my question is for the following, the next decade plan, what is the plans as far as it goes for student engagement and civic engagement from our youth? So, you know, some aspects of the next decade um, are gonna do what is NPS Clarity 2020. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people are thinking, oh, they're gonna wait until June to experience what this new plan is, mm -hmm. where we've actually been experiencing it. Part of NPS Clarity 2020 is to assess the last 23 years. Mm -hmm. So you can't be in June without having to reflect that, oh my goodness, I was in the school district 10 years ago and they're still talking about that. So what, what has to occur is to put into perspective what has happened from the first start of the state takeover of this school district. 
we'll glance at what was occurring before 1995 because there were some things that were being course corrected. Okay. Um, there are things that occurred since 1995 under the state operated school district of Newark that no one would have ever done if we wouldn't have made the change that we were required to by law. So there are a lot of great things that happened. Part of what NPS Clarity 2020 is, it confesses to that. It says, a lot of great things have happened here. Unfortunately, the $23 billion, $400 million should have got, given me a little bit more better results than 15% passing in math in the high school. So part of the work that we have is to say that the next move of getting us into the next decade is to understand that we get into the next decade by doing that work now. So we know that what's gonna happen in the first year of the plan, there are recommendations for the third year, the fifth year, and the 10th year of the plan. It's all being laid out in the work that is occurring, has occurred, and will occur and continue at the start of this coming school year. So in September, October, when we convene again with these round tables, it's to then solidify the 10-year portion of the plan. We already have parts of it in place. The good work that has occurred in NPS Clarity 2020 is doing what a strategic plan is supposed to do, which is to envision the future by actually doing it now. Specifically to your question, students will always be the heart of this administration. It is the most critical heartbeat in a classroom, as you've heard me say more on more than one occasion. And part of what we have to do is provide incredible resources to it from the central office and make sure that we remove obstacles throughout. As that heartbeat gets stronger, part of what the students will understand is that their role will be redefined. Actually, in, in the next decade, everyone's role will be re redefined. One of the questions that I usually ask people is, what do you think is missing? When I shared this with the principals, just to put your question into perspective, principals and administrators said, Charter schools are not on the list. Well, when you look at the logic model, they sure enough are, because charter schools have elementary schools and high schools. See, we're redefining the system as part of the next decade, which means everyone's role is different. Everyone's role, whether we govern over them now or not. And ultimately, the students are what will help us get there, as I've had and been engaging in some interesting conversations with some charter school students who would like to hear my perspective on things for them. In terms of you, you and people like you, and the leadership of the young man who's gonna speak after you, you know, he's modeled for everyone how, how true I will be to student voices, right? So in this reconfiguration, the way that we govern becomes different. The presidents of each of the organizations in student government, whether it's a student council or a student government organization, becomes a body of mine. That's why the conversation that we're gonna be having next week with key students, there are two representatives from each of the schools, they meet with me at my council, my superintendent's council of students, that is what will help generate an answer. I'm not gonna tell you what the students will do 10 years from now. You will stand as witness as to what they're gonna do because you're gonna help create that. See, in this city, we're so used to somebody coming in knowing what's gonna happen. I know what should happen. I know what should happen on this topic. I know what should happen on that topic. And I know that everybody behind me will be like, great, another one coming in here. This one was from here. Tell us what we're gonna do. la di di la di da That's not what's happening. Your voice will create the path. So I thank you. I'm proud of you. Um, why don't you share with everyone when I first actually saw you? What were you doing? <laughs> Tell them. So I do a program called North Youth Court. And the first time I met uh, Superintendent Leon was at that while I was in the position of the youth judge while on the bench. Um, so some actually, of these people may not know, so explain to them yeah. what's the... So Youth Court is a restorative justice program. It's an alternative for all students within the city of Newark, whether it be public or charter school, that we give out to all schools 
So and opposed to being suspended and that being on your record, being expelled and that being on your record, or going to court at 31 Green Street and that going on your record and you get in a criminal record, you're sent to our program and you're tried by a jury of your peers. The advocates, which are prosecuting defendants, are your peers, your age. The judge, like myself was the day Mr. Lee Un came in, is your age also. And you go through this restorative justice problem where we assess the situation you were in and we see what's the best way possible to bring you out of this on top. And so he was the judge. Let's give him a round of applause for that. So he was a judge, and because I love it when I'm humbled. Um, I was like, well, what college is he going to? Or no, sorry, what college does he attend? And the, the leaders of this program uh, who have wanted to work with the district for some time said to me, the College of Arts High School. <laughs> I was like, OK. I got lots to learn. I have lots to learn. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. I know you're going to make this great because you're the last speaker, Bradley Gonya. Hello. My name is Bradley Gomia. The N is silent. Um, I'd like to start out um, by saying, just talking about who we are because the basis is important. Um, I am a human. Y'all are all human. And for as long as I could remember, yeah, I've, I've been a person, a, a human. Um, and the, one of the awesome things about humans, like we're these magical machines, and we can transform the real, we can transform reality into the abstract, and then transform that abstract into what is our reality. So for the abstract, for transforming the reality into the abstract, we have our senses. I can see, I can hear, I can take in all the information around me and put it in my head and play around with it. And then I have my hands and I have my voice so I can then transform what is in my head into what is a reality what is all of our reality. Um, I think this is a fundamental part of what education is or should be. Um, guiding that essential part of what makes us human by teaching us how to transform reality into the abstract and then back into reality again and affect our world. So it is about teaching knowledge, but then also showing how to use that knowledge um, to transform your world. Yeah, that's, that's education. It's about agency as well as knowing what to do so that your agency doesn't hurt everybody. That's why it's a public institution, so you have to keep in mind other people as well. Um, but. In terms of that, I think a part that is a lot of times missing or that concept in and of itself isn't really grasped or held by a lot of people, um, and that would be in terms of you need everything. You need, to, you need to teach the knowledge, allow people to get that abstract, but then also teach them the agency or show them that they can be agents for change. Um, and a lot of times, just that basic concept is lost. Or um, we kind of think about extrinsic things, like, oh, is this going to get somebody a job in the future? And I think those are important to think about. But I think on a basic level, every day that I come to the classroom should be a day that I'm growing, not to get to a job, but just growing as a person to affect the world around me. Because the reason I'm getting the job is so I can affect the world and affect my life. So every day should not just be for the job. The job is secondary. Changing the world is primary. Um, and that agency is kind of lost a lot of time. Uh, so in what the students said, I think it was the, the highlight number two about student voice. I think student voice is is, is, is it's a cool concept, but I, it, it kind of 
it brushes over some things. And it's, it's more about student power because that's, your voice is a form of your power, but it's not the only way that you can change the world. I have my voice, I have my hands, and everything, right? Um, so it's more about increasing student power and empowering students so that they know, because you can, you can teach somebody that their voice matters, but you have to show them that they have agency. You have to give them the ability to exercise that agency and to actually affect the world that's around them. Um, with that being said, I think uh, including students in the entire process was very, it's, it's good. It hasn't been done before. Um, but there was just like this student round table and I, I wasn't, I didn't go to all the round tables, so my knowledge is limited. But there was, uh, I went to the student support round table as well. And it's cool to have the student round table, but if you're teaching this agency, this fundamental part of education, um, you should be teaching that you can't, you're not only limited in exercising your agency in one particular area, in one round table. Most of the students that, were, that participated in all of these round tables were in that one round table. And it's kind of, it's kind of crazy because um, the student round table was good, but just think about it. If you have one round table of uh, one type of stakeholder or constituent, um, in, yeah, you have one round table of one type of constituent. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of crazy to think about it, but that, if you're putting somebody in that position, now they're, they're, uh, they're like, they're, the, the problems in the, in the school district is, is large. So you can't, possibly, you can't possibly just break it down and say, oh, we're gonna have a student round table, which is a great idea, it's, it's a great idea, but you put them all in the same round, round table. Y'all get what I'm saying, right? So it's like there's, there's many things that students should be involved in. And if we're, actually on, if we're actually trying to empower students or give them that agency that is so essential to their education, um, we need to show them that uh, your voice or your power doesn't only exist in these silos, but it exists everywhere. And you should be able to, if you want to, focus on specific areas like, um, I don't remember all the names, like student support, like partners, like philanthropy, and all those things. Um, so I think that was super important. And just in terms of what the district and everybody that worked to create these roundtables, just the advice I would give would be to have that as something that's fundamental. And I, I, I can kind of get that everybody's kind of on this same page or understands what I, the, the basis that I laid out or the foundation that I laid out prior about what education is. But I think sometimes we, we skip over it or we don't make sure that everybody understands or make sure that we're following it to the T. Um, and I think that's kind of sometimes demeaning because we're, we're assuming that they, won't, they wouldn't understand what the foundation of why we're doing something is. So like, we need to always hark back to what education is, what we're really trying to do as people working together um, and trying to accomplish and respect everybody and their humanity. So back to, sorry, specifically um, the roundtables, the student support roundtable, one primary issue was that it was during, and it's kind of ironic, it's student support, but it was during the school day. Um, so like, you're, it's student support and it's during the school day, so students can't come. Yeah, I think we get to the point though. But the thing is, and then, but one second, mm -hmm. because it's all about putting it into perspective. Yeah. Right? So I get that the students today are different from when I was a student. Not, no. That's yeah. what I'm saying, no. No, no, I'm too. saying, yeah. The We're students not today <laughs> are different. The technology that people are using today, if I would have had it, it's very, very different. I didn't. I mean, when I had a cell phone, my cell phone was like as big as a box. Okay. So I'm just saying that times have changed. But one of the things that the students have to understand is that they've lived through a course of time 
where their voices were the only ones that stood up. They stood up so loud that they closed highways, they closed offices, and part of what I, what I want you to understand, and I know you know this, is that this administration does not speak to that. We're better than that. We believe that you have to be at the table. I think that your point about um, having a voice at all of the round tables is one is awesome. Uh, applaud it immensely. And as we get into the work ahead, we'll definitely make sure that we incorporate that. That's one of the things that's so powerful about you is that not only do you say things that are true, but then you make recommendations. That's a lot of adults would benefit from being able to stop complaining and actually make a, a, a critique that actually has a recommendation that actually would work if anyone listened to it. So I applaud you for that, but I also wanna put it into perspective that right now our students have to worry about everything. You have to worry about your friends. You have to worry about your friends not being alive the next day. You're worrying, I didn't have to worry about those things. Uh, you have to worry about, um, you know, is this teacher disrespecting you? You're worrying about mental health issues. Mm -hmm. And in your situation, and where, where it unfortunately leads, is you actually have to worry about the school district because it's not worthy of worrying about you. And all I'm saying is that while there will be opportunities, it's not going to be perfect. And ultimately, in the end, you are still a student. You are a child. And it is our job to actually do a good job for you. And all I'm saying is that while we will incorporate changes into the work that I think you make a valuable point, you also have to understand that it's our job to get it right. We shouldn't be in a situation where we do something and we're not listening to people. That we're not, it's like we're talking with, about parents, but we're not involving parents at the table. We're talking about curriculum, but we wouldn't involve teachers at the table. That's not what this administration is going to do. It's not what we're about and it's not what we're modeling. But I just wanted to put it into perspective that a lot of what has been learned over the years, there's a lot of undoing that also needs to, um, occur in multiple uh, aspects of the work. Okay. So that uh, there are so many of you still here, and I just wanted to take this opportunity just to thank you all for um, still being here. So let's give you all a round of applause for being, for being some troopers, some troopers. So on behalf of the school district, I know I wanted just to take the opportunity to at least look at you for a little bit and see who are the troopers who are still here and thank you for that. Big hug to all of you for that. Um, wanted to take the opportunity to once again um, thank uh, Dr. Wells and Dr. Fitzhugh as well as members of the team that you heard present. Let's give another big round of applause. And I know that we would want to share with them because I know the, uh, well I do the final thank you, the two board members are going to just share some thoughts as well. Um, June 13th is when we will actually debut, unveil, launch the new strategic plan. So we're excited that all everything will be in place to make that happen. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, there'll be people who are in here who we might very well ask to assist in reviewing some of the final drafts of the document. So I just want to make people aware of that. Um, you know, in particular, Mrs. Nelms um, has just been super helpful on, you know, critiquing the work and being a part of the work and living the work. So we would definitely, you know, want her eyes um, uh, there. Anything else with regards to that? So that's June 13th. We will be, you will look at the web, I would say, um, look at the web for the dates. We will obviously be doing major announcements about it. Um, but I would say look at the web or wait for those announcements just in case something changes and it's June 12th or June 14th. We want to make sure that everyone's aware. And just make sure that when you s checked in that we have information to get back uh, to everyone. I think I have everyone's contact information in the room. Anything else on that part? Yes. I would like to thank the Office of Family and Community Engagement 
Felicia Mann, Noreen Where's Noel Felicia? Joyce, Felicia Mann Dan, Garrett, Dan Denos, and the rest of the team that Dance have up here. made all of this work logistically possible and with whom it could never have been accomplished. So thank you. Awesome. Um, ready? Come on, Mr. Bledsoe. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Murray Thomas. Ms. Murray Thomas. Good evening, everyone. Or shall I say good morning, because I feel like we've been here for a long, long time. Um, I'll be very brief, because I know people have to go home, get to their families and to their beds like me. Um, I just want to thank you all for coming here. My name is Adorian Murray Thomas. I'm a proud, newly elected member on the school board. Um, and I'm so honored to, to be serving you as our city, as our students, as our parents, as our stakeholders. Um, we know that complex problems require complex solutions, right? If there's nothing else we can take from this evening, it's that we have a lot of work to continue to do. Uh, the great thing is that when I look at the room that's in front of me right now, and I look at everyone who is here over the course of the evening, and when I look at our kids in our schools, I know that we're in the right hands. And so I just want to thank you, because I know we are in a room of doers. Uh, I know that the work for Clarity 2020 did not begin or end tonight. Um, and so we will continue to do the work, um, and the work is possible because of the hearts and minds of each of you. Um, and if I can just give a special acknowledgement to our young people who are here, um, those of them who spoke, Bradley, the other young person and the young people who are here. I know your moms and dads maybe brought, dragged you here, uh, but you're here um, and you're the reason why we do this work. So I salute every each and every one of you. Uh, grateful to be working with and alongside you. Um, and let's have a great evening and keep getting the work done. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I'm going to be really, really brief. Um, I just would like to say um, to our superintendent, uh, boy, we, we have uh, a lot of hills to to get over, um, but to your team, uh, to Cree, um, we're gonna get there. And I'm excited about the roles ahead, um, where, we're gonna, where we're gonna go. And again, to the young people, uh, we're here to support you. Um, you do have Board of Education members who are committed to this work. Uh, we're committed to our superintendent, and we're committed to his team who are here, um, from Dr. Harrington to um, Samantha, uh, Carol and Granada, the team in uh, FACE. Um, we've all been charged with tasks and we've identified what those issues are and I think that going forward, uh, we're gonna have uh, those milestones uh, from year one to year three. And as I was speaking to Ms. Nelms, uh, while we're going through those, 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 ro those maps or those, those targets or trying to implement those, get to, get to those targets, that we have to make sure when we're doing it that we're staying um, relevant to the times because uh, as we know the train keeps going and there's constant changes going on uh, in this city and in this, uh, this state and while we're doing this and rolling this out we have to stay make sure that we're staying on top of the constant changes so to you uh, the chief um, superintendent Leon I stand with you committed uh, to do this work and uh, as always uh, we battle and we butt heads often um, but just know that you have an ally in me so thank you all right so it's that time about half hour ago right so um the rutgers university newark uh chancellor as well as her entire team are absolutely incredible if you don't mind because she'll definitely watch this video by our great uh video team in the back let's give uh chancellor and her uh, team a big round of applause and so the campus police here is very, very nice, but it is that time. And um, if you don't necessarily have to go home, you definitely need to leave here. Um, and so a safe uh, travels to your respective uh, homes, and we will see you again in two months. Actually, in one month, right? Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>